Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, but no more will we be behind you on the street of the stream of the Shack's former denizens, Splendid 2. One was adorned with masks, bandanas, and Zidane of cocktails converging around him on the barren clearing. The other, nothing but trudging feet, had it held held low, stretching back into the concrete jungle where Fujitsu cameras reigned supreme. Quitters. Even after all this time, a dejected smirk escaped his mouth as he shook his head. It all certainly felt different than he imagined back then, he thought, twiddling the bundle of dynamite sticks in his hand. No fancy chance, no grand charge against citadels of Ibukas, of vice, or hypocrisy, or whatever. Only the occasional shattering of glass was a couple of blocks away. When the day of recklessness came, it came in silence, and the silence Li Chan, chief assistant and the relief coordinator of Haizu, Zhu Zhi, and or Zhi Zhu and Li Wan shall break with thunder and flames in the grid of his fellow compatriots. It was his duty, after all. The obligation he earned for himself. He felt the hundreds of pairs of eyes upon his back again, like he'd always ever done since stepping into the shack's embrace that day. He just hoped he was worthy of them. Gone all of them. Lam Hasion's screams reverberated across the now empty warehouse, save for some flowers on the floor taunting him in silence. This is what happens when someone failed to spot check in the middle of the effing city. The CCO people had slipped away thanks to someone else's incompetence, and now his mission had to pay the price. Can't, can't wait for Guang Dong to plunge into the depths of heck tomorrow as if there wasn't already. <clears throat> but hey, Lime had, Lime had lived through heck. He can live through it again. What he, it's what he does. No big deal. <coughs> Chaos Umpire sits. Whether or not the sky was grim outside, the mood of the book of Monster was unquestionably grim, darkened with rage and fear. An emergency meeting was held in the office of the chief executive of the city of Guangdong, with all the big th five executives present. Their intrepid leader, whose actions had, had led to this pass, was quite literally dual wielding phones as if they were swords in the hands of a samurai at Sekigahara. Uh, chief executive Ibuka Masuru was shaking with rage as they shouted on the phone and listened to Kuro Miyazaki and Commissioner Tsushida stutter out their replies. The news was grim. Tsushida reported that the oil crash was the gut of the police, leaving them terribly overextended. Miyazaki reported that, with even greater trepidation, that the riders were systematically targeting surveillance networks, tearing out the security cameras left and right, and making the job even harder on the camp by ties as on the Guangdong police. At that point, Ibuka simply lost his mind and shouted, Well, then fix the darn problem, gosh darn you. Go put the mother effing cameras back up. Sushita stammered out, We're trying, sir, I swear, we really are. As the words left Sushita's mouth and Miyazaki put his head in his hands, the fuel of rage seemed to burn in uh, Ibuka's eyes, leaving only weariness. Misery. At last he ground out, very well, go do what you need to do, and I'll see about your support. Goodbye. Then Ibuka hung up on both of the phones, but one hand shook, dropping a phone to the ground, and Li Kuxing picked it up and put it on its hooks. Ibuka nodded slowly in thanks, and then looked at the rest of the tycoons. The man looked at him in concern. It was clear. The man was so terribly tired. The bags under his eyes seemed to have bags under them, too, Morita, however, thought. I would feel more pity for you, Masaru, had you not put yourself there. Helpless. Burning, burning, burning. Oh, that was pretty good. His eyes were burning. His vision hazy. His ears still rung with the aftershock of the explosion. He smelled smoke and charred meat in the sweat of hundreds, all mixing with the usual stench of the city to brand his mind with a uniquely horrible scent. He tasted blood. Grasping his way back down to reality, a pounding sound in his mind, pushing him back down. Persevering, holding onto the image of his son's face like his life depended on it, it like they did, he emerged from the confusion and shock. That was a gruesome scene. He stared in the face of one of those under his command. His eyes were glazed over, blood visibly draining from his skin as it grew more pale. Then hand clawed at the lieutenant's head, dragging the scrap, uh, strap of his helmet harshly across his chin. Looking up, he saw a face filled with unimpeded fury. Looking down, he saw more faces, each attached to another pair of hands reaching for its armor weapons. Just as the new hand entered his field of vision, accelerating on a collision course with his nose, he opened his mouth. Fire! It sounded strangled, and the hand continued its downward trajectory. Fire! His body finally cooperated. <coughs> and with the moments, all other senses were swept away by the deafening crack of gunfire. A hail of lead rained on the twisted hands, sending them reeling. A wall of blood erupted in the wake, accompanied by fresh hands pulling them to safety. Breathing in, breathing out. The lieutenant no longer smelled the toxic concoction. Instead, the cleansing perfume of iron scum powder greeted his nostrils, clearing and relaxing his racing brain. A satchel charge, a makeshift one of that, had been thrown in front of him, and before he knew it, he had ended up on his back, helpless in heavy ride gear. Now the crowd dispersed, helpless before his well armed men. Sighing, he slumped back, gazing up at the clouds. Medics rushed to his side, but his eyes, dripping shut, burned no longer. Heart attack. We have not spent much time, money, and effort bending the legislative council to our will for them to go sign in a moment of crisis. They represent Fujitsu's interests and policies to the larger populace of Guangdong and the emissaries of the promises of Guangdong will become. If the Chinese and Zhuzhi insist on clinging to memories of the past and obsolete concepts of life, then their messaging has clearly fallen short. The legislative council must redouble their efforts to propagate our message to the masses, and will make clear what happens to those who shrink from their duties, for they have no place in the future we envision. Ears deafened. Ooh. Increase of strength, that's what we like. <laughs> We continue around the police camp by time Fujitsu militias to serve as enforcers of our vision of Guangdong's future, even as the tribulations of the oil crisis have worn on the nerves and thinner numbers. More, now more than ever, those loyal to us must be made aware of the cost of failure. Reactionaries and sentimentalists alike bear down on the gates of progress, and they are the first in the firing line. The choice has been made for them, we only have to remind them of what? No carrot? Fine. Let's stick then. 
Look, he's go during the middle of the oil crisis. Who's used to reach out to the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen and its various oh uh, associates? The intent was to offer the G. GFT Fujitsu associate status, and they threatened to declare the organization illegal if it did not comply. When the tradesmen <clears throat> refused, they had no illusions about the likely severity of the consequences for the refusal, but they were not about to bow down before a man that had made their very existence hollow. Their resolve was tested and proven true. The day Fujitsu militias and Guangdong police officers raided the offices of GFT aligned firms to preempt any subversion, when the Fujitsu law came in and made demands, the targets did not bow down as they might have expected. No. The Fujitsu, Fujitsu employees began to shout at one another, particularly the Zhu Jin working in the Fujitsu detachment. <clears throat> Each side was not able to completely shut down the other. They just kept shouting past one another while the others looked out in anger and amusement. Years later, no one was able to identify who threw the first punch, but the first punch was thrown, and then it into a full-on, no-holds-barred physical violence. The government forces and the office workers beat each other brutally left and right, even unto death. Sparing no mercy to one another, or to the trappings of their office, they raged against one another, trapped as they were between death and destruction. Obviously, the office layout was practically unrecognizable once a stronger anti-riot deployment cleared the building, yet those anti-riot forces had countless calls upon the strength as the days wore on in Guangdong. Why? The scene, far from ab an abnormality, was becoming the norm in Guangdong's Zhujin communities, and everyone, even the government's partisans, knew who to point at for why. <coughs> we could have had it all. You did this to me, the whisper tumbled out of your book's mouth, all of you, year after year, turning Guangdong into a bubbling cesspool under my nose and setting it on fire in my face just at the right minute. Truly well played, gentlemen. Consider me floored. Look up. Ibuka, please, enough. Only exasperation remained in Morita's voice. You brought the gosh darn Manchurians in all those years ago, not me. Please, for all our sakes, just admit your fault for once. Oh, I can't. I'm sorry. Ibuka's retort was brief. Uh, blunt, crashing upon Morita like an iron club. I just can't. This is my project, my experiment. I built it out of nothing, saved it from nothing, and you're telling me this is somehow my fault? The whispering was morphing and swelling into screeching now. You're telling me I'm supposed to be paying for other people's screw-ups and you expect me to just be fine with it all? Maybe stop slacking off on security then, if your little experience is so precious to you, Kumai Scott. Besides, because I'm not even going to... I'm not seeing nearly enough bullets fired. If you don't have the gall to do what has to be done, I suggest you spit it already and let the right people do the job. <clears throat> that does it. Ibuka darted to his feet, bringing this chair into the ground with a thud. Kumai swear to God, if I hear another sound from that crap over on her face, I said, just, let's just do Ibuka a favor for now. Masashita sighed at the time, sprung up from the seat with a sigh. I'm sure he needs the time to think it all over. Maybe get some much needed rest, too. <clears throat> With this, all the other four men filed out of the room, trail by resigning slam, leaving Ibuka Masu, chief executive of the city of Guangdong, behind. Yeah, the thought, though, through. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Brain hemorrhage. Brain hemorrhage. Uh, Fujitsu has become. has overcome every problem set up before with the same tools. Try and test of human innovation and ingenuity. Balance when unleashed. These civil disturbances are just another challenge, another requirement to be resolved in pursuit of our eventual objectives. Only well, if it's YouTube sees a feature, and we shall see it come to fruition no matter the cost. Fear him not, fear him not, therefore. Day after day, Ibuka Masu, the chief executive of Guangdong, had been horrified and enraged by what he heard. But a few things that hit him as hard as he was hearing as he went to the Lego building for the first session in weeks. Information about the circumstances. <clears throat> In which Komai Kenichiro's brutal Hitachi Corporation had been invited to Guangdong had been leaked. All details supported uh, the support of Manchuria and the Kwangtung army that couldn't import from the King and from Mukden, and worst of all, the fact that it had been Ibuka that had come up with the oh so clever idea of inviting Komai to Koshu. Well, no public knowledge, and as one might imagine, Ibuka's reputation declined yet further due to all this, further than anyone else, let alone Ibuka, had thought possible. Worse yet, the leakers were members of the Lenko, flat out admitting that their involvement to Ibuka's face right there in the chamber. Most of vile of all was a revelation that the majority of these leakers were Matsushita men. At the at that, the chamber erupted into chaos, and the local security officers were in full force on the floor trying and failing to keep order. Ibuka sprang up from his chair and stomped over to Masashita Masaharu to demand an explanation. At that, Masashita shrugged elegantly. What he said next was, or the blunt as he'd been in a long time. Chief Executive, I am not responsible for my associates. Besides, they have suffered at your hands for a long time, and I understand that they're anger all too well. In fact, I believe you, the Chief Executive, are just as responsible as them for these times, if not more so. And then all 98 eyes saw the front frost swallowing Ibuka's face. No was all the chief executive could mutter. God, not you too, Matsushita. You can't do this to me. You can't, you stupid swine. And came the buzz of the button, the clicking of the lapis-draped men's boots on the marble floor. For the first time ever in Guangdong's history, a legislative council meeting was dismantled by force. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Virtual insanity. All those regions went, Guangdong has always been something of an active nightlife, ever since the first settlements was on what is now known as the Pearl River Delta. At no time was this more true, Li Chun reflected now than now, during the great struggle against Ibuka and his engineer's paradise. You put it in four words, things were simply screwed over. And it was a good thing to Chun's mind. 
Guangdong Federation tradesmen members join hands with the Committee of Chinese Labor to bring chaos to the umpire seat throughout the Ibuka's Hako. Clusters of protesters, numbering in the thousands, occupy public spaces that the Japanese were ordinarily fond of. They clustered outside of government centers and destroyed or desecrated what they could. They down and cocktails flew in every direction. At uh, Fujitsu storefronts, research facilities, and screens, one might ask. Why target Fujitsu when Hitachi did it? <coughs> John would laugh at such a question right in the face of a person who asked it. So what if Hitachi was Chun's still out brother who'd call the proximate cause of the misery? Ibuka and Fujitsu were to blame for this hack crap beyond any soul lover of a doubt. But oftentimes the Japanese occupiers more generally were blamed, often resulting in a tripolar ethnic clash between Japanese, Zhu Jin, and Chinese. There was, of course, talk about Japanese occupation, reunifying with China, socialist revolution, and what have you, but Chun knew those are not what was on the minds of the people running amok on the streets of Guangdong that night. Real really, what was going on was a fight for the scraps of human de dignity, which Ibuka's Guangdong had been so unwilling to give them. And if those dudes did not give the, poor, the people their due this time either, then they would just have to watch their precious effing tech get ruined. <clears throat> Total vascular failure, huh? Well. Immense sums have been spent to uh, end Mish. Guangdong in a web of cables and surveillance tapes, shining light on the darkest crevices of our cities and townships. None of this investment will be of any use if it goes unmanned in time when we need to get uh, every share of visibility we can get. We'll mandate a member of our security forces, Fujitsu's engineers and our executives, to man the surveillance systems at all hours. Not a single suspect movement must escape the notice. Uh, we can excuse laziness in normal times, but in times like these, there can be no excuse for tardiness. Nibbling on the second hand. Anything else here? Ooh. Track them? Nice. That's what's all good to do. Uh, we haven't really changed here at all. Uh, yeah, it got slightly worse for us. Is this supposed to Zujin and Chinese support? I don't want to do that or decrease our increase of corruption, so we're not going to do that one either. Only 77 days. Corruption is at barely going up, which is good. So, <clears throat> a whirl and a click. A chrome clock cassette sled lazily on the deck, retrofitted to the side of the main module, another worth weeks, week's worth of lamb who blood and sweat with it. He spun the dial, pressed enter, and leaned back into ever so slightly. Back to just the two of us, buddy. Nothing more entered his senses save for the constant droning of the radiator fans as he leafed through his own mind once more behind closed eyelids. Explosions. Shanty towns emptied overnight. Corpses of three Japanese prominence at 45 Hanmin Road. All sporadic. <clears throat> Uh, fleeting ripples among the sea of mayhem at first glance, so, anyway. Years of piloted experience that led them to the dots, and his trusty Falcom Aro had to do his letting come up. Just the two of them. Doing a job made for ten. Any more people would be a liability. Beep. He opened his eyes and snapped to the left towards the monitor, and behold, printed in the pristine clarity of cathode rays. Everything that mattered, point of interest. Prospect of CCL threat. He smirked. A function of his own design, too. The good one, uh, the one good thing that ever came out of all those Fujitsu vocational schools. The Haosion ha Technique. Reincarnate. <coughs> he threw open his notebook. Prosperity Gardens. Hi. Read the screen. His pen scribbled. Recommended, recommended a response. Lethal Forest. The side of Shan, Shan Mian Church. Hi. Recommended response, Lethal Force. Total demolition of the place, too, if the situation calls for it. Funny, Ah Kwong would have thrown that same petrified look every time he'd seen those notes. If his face hadn't blown, been blown off two days ago, that is. Kantan Koran headquarters, high. Perfection of his second name stirred something within him, and there was gone. Recommended response, Lethal Force. <coughs> Target the police. <coughs> Minimal. I guess we could do this, too. Why not? More government despair is pretty good to have. Dependence, dependence only. The Kawashima family tried to distract Haruka with a little favorite dawn and a picture of the book as the car weaved towards Koshu Airport. Through the designated thoroughfares. Even she, however, noticed the car stopping every so often, watching her parents exchange word glances as the dim silhouettes of soldiers peered inside, warily cradling their rifles. She noticed time to pack up when her parents looked relieved, even before they tapped her on the shoulder to urge her to hurry. Haruka clambered out of the car without delay, flanked by a gaggle of suited men who pushed the family past the line, snaking out from the terminal entrance. For the, these are for you two. Haruka saw her father hand two boarding passes to her mother, speaking as brightly as he could despite the word etched onto every wrinkle on his face. Take Haruka back to your parents' place in Hamatsu. I'm sure they'll be happy to see you both. Hamamatsu. Hamamatsu. What about you? Her mother took the two paper stubs before clasping her father's sleeve with her free hand. There are people dying in the streets. They can't, cut the company, can't the company call you back to Tokyo? I'm sorry, her father said, looking guilty as the security surrounding them before turning his gaze to the floor. Right now, it's also she had dependence only. They need me to keep whatever workers we have left in the factories. The Japanese districts are still safe. The soldiers are scary, Papa. Haruka grabbed onto her father's le pants leg, squeezing the fabric as tight as her child's grip allowed, but I'll be more scared without you. At that, her father's expression twisted into a pain smile before he's crushed down to look at Haruka in the eye. I'll be home soon, I promise. <clears throat> Two swarms by Yasuka Yasukawa Yoshiko. My well, commute this morning was rather tense. After being escorted onto the early train by armed guards, barely holding back the howling mob, our views in the moving cars alternated between the fathomless darkness of the underground and the destructive 
phantasmorgia of the surface. Some sat in silence. Others muttered between themselves about how the, the end had come. A swarm of locusts had come to devour our prosperity. Let us dispel the illusion. These riots cannot be blamed upon the explicable, explicable evil of the crazed masses, nor that of an apocalyptic plague. Those throwing bricks in the streets look upon the towers of Central Koshi with murders free, while those at the top look down with a mix of hap apprehension and revulsion, but neither are as opposed as they would like to think. Both seek to live inside of a faded photograph. One side brings endless rows of selenite so stone portraits to the streets, while the other gazes longingly at the old issues of the Niki, trying to convince themselves of the days of endlessly expanding Yasuda stock are still with us. I cannot say I do not sometimes long for the days before Yasuda died, my father with it. But if that had been the case, and Yasuzuki not been ousted, what future would have been created for Guangdong, and what for myself? I have created a future uniquely of, of and for myself, a promise held by the Koshu of, of the present, but impossible under the Koshu of the past, though. The writers may idolize revolutionaries and sell themselves as such, though... And though corpulent old money may fear it as such, this is no revolution. New, no, no new society, no new way of living can be born from the slaps into chaos. The most it can hope to receive in the way of settlement is scraps thrown upon high by those who must fear change, in order to ensure both top and bottom remain stagnant forever. Both groups hope, play, hope to placate the future, but the future does not placate. The future demands, and thus always the traitors. Li Hei should have known better than think that it would have come after Fushitsu Holdings and Koshu. He should have realized that the raging laborers at Nunez of Guangdong, his brother, not least among them, would want to take out their anger on Ibuka Fujitsu and their trader lackeys. Most importantly, Hei should have deluded himself into thinking that he would have been anything better <clears throat> than, than prepared or unprepared for dealing with a lot of angry protesters. A sun set in red over a city reddened with blood and rage, a targeted attack, compromising vandalization, among other anti state activities, was in initiated by the joint forces of the GFT and the CCL. The police was only barely able to hold the riders back, passing by Commissioner Tsushida. He saw the sails in his hands as he called for reinforcements every place he could. Eventually, against a better judgment, Tsushida and Colonel Miyazaki said, Fujitsu employees were sent to, uh, to go and go head-to-head -head with the riders and hopefully hold them long enough for reinforcements to come in. It was painfully clear that neither Hei nor any of the other Juzin or Cantonese working for Fujitsu, say nothing of the Japanese who controlled it, knew any other method of dealing with angry people than confronting them. <clears throat> He joined full force in the shouting, his heart torn between anger and horror. He felt ever greater misgivings about the situation, but he only carried on. Then it all went to crap. Sam Ryder threw a projectile that landed squarely on his shoulder. When the people opposite him noticed he was disoriented, people started to gang up on him. The last things he saw and heard were the angry faces of his fellow countrymen, and yells of traitor, sell out and worse. Going out the window. Or out the window. Um, how are we looking down here? I, I just don't think we can do anything here. This is just... I'm not wanna, I don't want to decrease our Zuzian support. Because right now, Zuzian supports what? Oh, well, we can't really tell. Right here. Yasuka, well, it's great that writing these things make you feel independent and uplifted, said Takasaki. Glaring, really, I'm happy for you, but this is, isn't about you. I have a magazine to sell and I have salaries to pay. We have a line here and I expect you to stick to it. A fainting humming had sound been coming from somewhere near the Canton Corner offices, but neither paid any mind. Familiar noises of chaos. I am sticking to the line, sir, said Yoshiko, her lips pursed, her tone flat. This is the line we agreed to take when we became a general affairs magazine. If we change your line every time we are inconvenienced, it will be left with no readers whatsoever. We would be right a few weeks ago, but if you haven't noticed, uh, the whole country's on fire, and everyone's blaming the same man except us and the Fujitsu papers. Well, the captain wants us to go down with the ship, fine by me, but I will not go down with the ship on this behalf, and I won't have you doing it either. You won't have me doing one thing or the other. I'm not a thing to be owned and controlled. You are the captain of the ship, Takasaki, and you say the course will be wrecked upon the waves. The sounds from outside were getting louder, angry, but over unheard over each other's shouts. For heaven's sake, Yasukawa, take a look out the window. This course will slam us straight into an iceberg. Yoshiko stormed towards the window. Fine, I'll look out. You know what I see? She looked out and down. What oh, I see? Her voice trailed off. What? What is it, Yasukawa? They're here. Total vascular failure. Well, the riders deserve nothing less than a stick. It's regrettably necessary to provide the rest of Guangdong's indolent masses with a carrot. What's more, they should be reminded of the boons Fujitsu had brought to their standards of living. Economy and human progress. Fujitsu is beneficial. It is necessary. There's no alternative. They'll be made to understand no matter how many times we must repeat ourselves. Remain calm, remain calm, remain calm. Oh. That's nice. We, the Soviet Union. We have bigger problems to deal with right now. Huh. Uh, the crossroads. <clears throat> A uh, crowd gathers around the entrance of the concrete and corrugated iron brick named Nintendo Industrial Building Number no. 3, held back by a police cordon. The windows were boarded out, the entrance is sealed with makeshift barricades, and armed members of the CCO occupied the factory floor. Which had a vacate hours ago, they fired off a volley of recriminations in response. One of the police officers in the cordon called out for the riders to negotiate, and he caught a flying wrench to his head for his troubles. Within the crowd, Yamauchi Horoshi watched on helplessly. This was his largest facility where he and Yokoi rolled out thousands of new novelties and amusements. Now the facility was broken, another victim of the riots of Grip Guangdong, Yamauchi squinted and saw through the windows that some of the industrial equipment had been ripped out of the place and used to barricade the largest ingress points. It would take millions to get this building operational again, and who knew if Nintendo would have the millions when this was all over? <coughs> within, 
uh, everything seemed to be approaching the moment when the cops crossed the threshold and dragged the rider out by force. Fujitsu never had compromised at the best of times. But what's there now? But is Yamauchi. Heard the shrill cries from inside the factory and recognized with shame the voices of some of his best workers. He knew that a heavy-handed response would destroy a facility that could be self salvage and doom Nintendo's chances for survival, but was it a heavy-handed solution with Fujitsu did best obstacles in its way? Against all odds, Yamauchi prayed for a peaceful solution. Try to dismantle it. Never heard this one before. <coughs> Smug little dude, ain't he? Smart Mark, one of the many huddled detectives around the briefing room, rows of CRT monitors, and their trembling static hands lay the flickering visage of the same man on the news feeds and in surveillance footage. The protest leader stood, flanked by scores of his comrades. I'd be smug too if I got to spew all his day. Spew all this all day without getting kicked down, sw down swiftly downtown, said the chief investigator. Judging by his little stand-up actor on the KHK, that's exactly what college boy over here thinks. Non-violent civil disobedience, my butt, but we know better. Do we sir ask a voice from the back of the room? We still got nothing that'll stick. No trace of movements, just associates and dubious links. So probe the stupid associates in, smart booty, replied the chief. Do you think I called you in for a pep talk? A pep talk? A man keeps his movements guarded well, but he's got a big entourage, and we have a list of their names right here. The chief held up the list from a pile of photocopies. One of them's bound to squeal. He turned to the man who had interrupted him, and for the sake of your badge, they better. Stop the presses. It did not take long for the mob to crash through the overturned desk, hastily made into a makeshift barricade. Those unlucky enough to still be pushing furniture against the entrance were slammed aside, and Yoshiko watched in horror. As the crowd surged inside, more liquid than solid mass, many spewing downward to the basement level where the printing machines were, while the others were simply happy to trash their atrium. Yoshiko scanned the entrance area, hoping against hope that some kind of exit would make, magically make its way into existence, but none came. Even though ragged masses of crowds had ceased to occupy the doorway area, a couple of large men remained, brandishing makeshift clubs. No chance. Besides, only the crowd would wait her. A crowd she was evidently not part of. The Canton Coromos would be hostage zone or charnel house, and Yoshiko could only hope for the former. A stack of, of the Koron's next most recent most oh, most recent issue lay not to the one side, and one rider bent forward to retrieve a copy after studying it for a couple seconds. Chuckling to himself, he pulled out a match. Yoshiko let out what she felt like a small noise, when she could not have attracted attention over the sounds of the crowd, but turned her head her turned heads her way nonetheless, causing her heart to skip a beat. Another rider slapped the match out of his hand in the first, causing a brief argument before the second man approached her, grabbing her wrist. My name's Chun, the man said, in a badly accent Japanese. Nice magazine. Lo Bok Tao, you're coming with us, don't worry. I don't hit women. He does, though, he said, pointing to a particularly large and unpleasant looking man behind him. He pulled a forward move as she was pulled, tripping in struggling room, struggling from the stairway. Another mask came into the atrium, clad in black and holding guns. This is the police. Surrender or die. We gotta get that. Those, uh, concerns rising. Good cop, bad cop. If you want to read this one, please go ahead. I've read this one before, so. <coughs> the men's of the people. After all, it became impossible to ignore, no matter how hard one tried. Every scene in Hong Kong had a poster on it. Uh, ooh, have I read this one before? I think I've, no, maybe not. They were on the fronts of buildings, gates, telephone poles, cars, anything and everything that could possibly cover by them. They were a white algae that covered the entire city in four word slogans. Ever this one before. You couldn't close your eyes to avoid it either. Those same slogans of the posters were shouted full volume in innumerable protests and marches that were on the seemingly every hour, every single hour. Even if you were in tall buildings like Ibaku, Ibuka Masaru was, the whole noise was very much so audible. Then there was the violence. Every single day the chief executive received lurid reports of detail on the clashes between police and protesters. It didn't take long before he realized that the riots were taking a serious toll in Guangdong. If the objectives would make their demands clear, he thought, they've done their job. Some time had passed since the riots began, enough to consider carefully whether it was worth responding to them or not. But it's only worth at least thinking about, the chief executive thought, since more than enough blood has already been shed already. The riots were dissolved in Guangdong by the second, and if talking to the protesters could help bring an end to all this, then well, why not? On the other hand, negotiating and failing would even be worse. A broken promise would be getting worse than make no promises at all. And no telling how the like or, or still Japan would react if word got out they were talking to the radicals. Ibuka Masu gave it some more thought, a difficult decision looms. Where is my mind? Hey, spirit danced in and out of consciousness for an indeterminate amount of time. The waking moments were as dreamlike as those, well, under the veil of sleep. A surreal array of beeping medical chatter and the screams of recently injured. The air felt hot, cramped, through all it was hard for Hay to gauge the population of the room through his brief moments of blurry vision. Sometimes he felt the presence of figures standing over him. Doctors, Fujitsu men, his family, he couldn't tell. Occasionally, a metallic taste entered his mouth in order to dispense tasteless slurry to his stomach. Later, a revolting wetness between his legs periodically wiped away without his own input, for he was unable to give any. How long had it been? Days? Weeks? Years? 
A coherent idea of time had been lost to Hay, along with most of the other bodily functions. His physical presence of himself bounced up and down his body. Unable to work almost any part of the fractured shell, was this permanent? What would become of his family? Were they still alive? And did they care? Would Sean care? Was he out doing what had been done to uh, him, to other Zujim? That was what he sought to be, right? And what did that even mean anyways? Achievement? Subservience? Being a fractured wreck? In his dreams, he received all sorts of answers. Encouragement, condemnation, a slight indifference, all swirling around his brain without coherence. Nothing made sense to sleep or awake. Was the world still in one piece? If it was, then why couldn't Hay reach out and touch it? If it wasn't, then why did he hurt so much still? No answers came, or even though even thoughts coherent enough to be thought of as on the cusp of them. So he lay and drifted for a while, for an eternity, a space between oblivions. Sticking so carrot. The corporation will be rewarded, the chief began. I uh, succeed on the suspect. However, if you choose not to do so, you will not see the outside of a jail cell for a long time. He searched for a reaction, any of compliance, any sense of submission. He found none. A speckled office worker, so the chief defiance was evident in his face. A mirthless laugh filled the concrete room. Julius could not be the best that GPF has to offer. He looked down at the table. Have you, have you no mind what risk I've already taken by joining the supposed subversive organization? He removed his spectacles, staring down at the officer, his eyes burning like lasers. Do your worst, so I'll give up nothing. Chief reclined in his chair, glancing over the companions. His finger tapped on the table, hopes of an easy breakthrough dashed. Forward. No time to think, no surrender, move or die. Uh, Chun hurled the struggling woman towards the police line as they struggled to ride her uh, and keep her gun, their guns trained as she stumbled into the shields, hurled himself out of the window. Glass shards and pillow skulls he tumbled through, landing hard on the ground, but he felt no pain. T no time to think. No time for pain. Get out, survive. The sound of gunfire emanated from the magazine office, aimed at him or others. Had he stayed still, would they have shot that woman? Not th worth thinking about. Chun turned and ran. And continued, th continued the pace for what felt like hours, as the uncaged animal inside him slowly drifted to sleep. And since the slayer with pain and doubt, his body begged him to slow down and stop. He refused all commands from his brain to do just that. He was sure some cops had chased him for a while before tapering off, or maybe not. Block after block, bur blurred runners abounded. Crowds of police going one way, crowds of Chinese going another. Stragglers being ambushed from old alleyways by knife-wielding Japanese thugs. He hadn't been caught, despite the close calls. Not yet. Where was he now? It had been street after street of black smoke reflected against broken glass. A great movie strip of chaos made it ordered by repetition. But that was all this place did, wasn't it? You can leave the factory, attempt to tear it all down, but you end up achieving its, is bringing the factory's brutality to the streets. Even running. A four-year life becomes a standardized, repetitive task, performed by thousands at once to no real game. Despite all his efforts, Chen remained really human, trapped in a place antithetical to humanity. <laughs> no, he couldn't think like that. He had to keep moving. Fight after... Fight again on another day. Avengers he'd abandon. Keep running, keep running, keep running. Chun thought to this over and over again, without realizing he'd already fallen to his knees. Keep moving forward, keep moving. Discreet inquiries. There was one subject that the riots and that everyone around Chief Executive Ibuka Master had steadfastly refused to always allow it, even if everyone had thought it more than possible. Republic of China, never friendly to Guangdong's existence, had kept his public statements limited to calling for the protection of the Chinese citizens in Guangdong and their staff. Have been a thorn in the side of the government, claiming that consular privileges over Chinese nationals gumming up investigations seemingly at random. And what are the interventions by the Chinese? Uh, weren't random. What if, in addition to consular assistance, the Chinese had decided to vent their displeasure with Guangdong through other more active interference? The motives and the opportunity were present, all that remained were the means. Quietly, the police made as many safe. <clears throat> Deniable quarters as they could, considering the consulate's recent activities. They would not take the first step into the diplomatic minefield that would surely result from a full investigation, but it would be negligent to not lay the foundations ahead of time. What are the Chinese up to? Probably nothing good. Because he ain't got nobody to listen. What's going on? What the heck is going on? Um, uh, I think I read this one before. But we're going to read it anyways. Uh, Nagano Shigeto, Lieutenant General of the Imperial Japanese Army and the commander of the Guangdong Garrison was not happy, not happy at all. Those laws good for nothing crap as Chinese and Zhujin alike were making a ruin of Guangdong and defying the government, spreading chaos wherever the heck they wanted. At hearing another report of worsening in Chinese lawlessness, Nagano lost his temper and decided to get hold of that pencil out of the book of the Office of the Chief Executive. Thank you for your call to the office of His Excellency to the Chief Executive of the City of Guangdong. Regrettably, the Chief Executive is unable to receive your slam. Click dial again. And did it again. And again. And again. Nagano slammed the phone on his desk and threw his cap against the wall. This was it then. Screwer would uh, rather curl up in a corner than face a mess, mess he made. To add to his anger, a telegram from Tokyo turned up on his desk and while I was calling and recalling Ibuka. Orders to wait. Await orders. Stop. Maintain prior deployments. And so those agents in Tokyo weren't even letting him do what he needed to maintain order. A storm began to rumble outside, and Nagano put his head in his hands, weighing his increasingly limited options. One thing was clear, Ibuka had brought this all on himself. Everywhere else in the city, that realization was coming to Ibuka, too. Paradise Lost. Ah! Hubris, Nemesis, Catharsis. I never asked any for this. Did I channel all my vase, my all my vigor, all my decades of accumulated expertise into building this shining bastion of reason? 
For the South China Sea, just for it to be great to the ground before my eyes, did I offer a helping hand to those rabid dogs just for them to sink their ungrateful fangs into? No, of course not. None of it was supposed to end this way, but it did, in spite of no, because of everything I'd done. <clears throat> What did I go wrong? Just what would it take to silence all the screams and shouts and fire crackles that hammered into the rotting brains of Guangdong is dying all thanks to them? Just what would it take for them to F and get it? No, there must be an answer lying somewhere else. There has to be. Please, someone tell me. How did we, I, get here? <coughs> you don't need lower chance support anymore for now. I don't want to lower Zushin support either. Do you think we can decrease Japanese uh, anger and whatnot? Coin toss. Under the cold morning dawn of Guangdong, nestling his head in the neck of his police jacket, Sato Atushi, attempting to stave off the harsh, batting winds of the Guangzhou winds of little to no avail. Casting jagged silhouettes into the bluish gray sky, ships and freighters of. All sides in the shapes lazily drifted in and out of the port. The skyscrapers opposite Sato saw the colossal neon signs on, with pinpricks of lights dotting the faces, each window holding their own story and dramas exclusive to the people inside of the salaryman of Sony Hitachi. Their worries about pay raises or promotions must seem like the most urgent thing in the world. How lucky they were. Sergeant, a voice spoke up from behind. We have a lead. Or rather, two, turning around, a fresh face police officer greeted him, his baggy uniform too large to fit on the boy, and in his hand there was a torn up piece of paper. Sato greeted, grabbed the paper and dismissed the boy. He knew that the grunts were angry young men. He had hoped that the emphasis was on angry, not young in that phrase. No matter. Brought in two suspects in the case of no rep. Municipal worker and shopkeeper related to lieutenant. The intelligence is not sure how exactly, but we have a good profile, lieutenant. All you need is station. We need you at station immediately. We can break those two and get them to spill the guts. Biao. Biao. P.S. Why do you keep disappearing so often? Related to lieutenant. The intel here was shaky to be cordial. But they're now getting a Cretan labyrinth without a ball or string. I remembered his classes correctly. If they were related, then they were the only leads they had, but even if they didn't manage to crack the lieutenant, it wouldn't matter if it was all too late. The world was behind this was smart, smart and fast, and they were constantly making themselves unpredictable and hard to track. If they didn't get something soon, then they might as well have never tried. Pillars of sand, pillars of salt. That they show temper of their vision. Concede. Please, maggots, parasites. Ask yourself. They bark, they bite, they whine. Reach out. It is their fault, it always is. Make amends. Oh. <coughs> they bark, they bite, they whine. It's no one of these insects are trying to tear down what I've created. They barely have any cohesion amongst them. And so how could they possibly understand anything greater than their own base impulses? That's fine. I can work with that. Throw some meat in the pen. The dudes will rip each other to shreds for this tiniest morsel. You want a better life, do you? Have to work for it, then. Give me the names and places I need, and you'll get your scraps. Let's see how much of a fight the rest can put up while looking over their shoulder constantly. Pillars of salt and sand. Oh, so now the Chinese decided to try something with any semblance of ambition, and of course, it's burning down their own homes in a temper tantrum. Time and time again, I ask myself, why can't even all be like the, that Li He kid or even the Zhu Jim? How the heck do these people manage to dominate East Asia for two millennia? From all I've seen, despite all I've done, the Chinese want nothing more than to live like cavemen. Fine, I'll give you what you want. Time to send the CCO back to the effing Stone Age. Room without view. Control, we're reconfirm re re address. Apartment 418-273, Wang Jingwei Road. You have this in writing. Is there an issue? We're there. Place is vacant. Has been for some time. You guys lied to us. Has location been thoroughly examined? All potential hiding places looked through. That's a crappy apartment, not Hishmi Castle. Unless they're being led to dust mites. By dust mites, we're wasting your time here. One moment, the radio was silent for several moments. Return to the precinct immediately. Suspect will be subject to further questioning. A cop that control telling the interrogation put the screws in properly this time. Maybe some actual screws. The itching plague. My god, there's so much reading at the end. Uh, it's a quiet night in the barracks, a short ways outside of the heart of urban chaos. Something that was considered a minor tragedy to those inside. If the horizon was not exactly clear, nothing was coming towards Private Hano's guard post. <clears throat> mm, Japanese observer. That's not true. <clears throat> not a sound, not a single darn soul coming to receive punishment. His hands desperately seeking a solution to discomfort. Uh, oh, I've read this one before, so we want to do this one. Please go ahead again. So, I'm sure they maintain the confidence in you, or matters may be taken out in your hands. December. 26, 1971. 
or dull, booming chimes pierced through the torrential downpour, despite there not being a single clock tower in sight. The rain was intermingling with the muffled yells and screams outside the glass panes, melting into one gigantic, all-devouring sizzle that seemed to only come out of my head. Was the heat a fever, or just another product of my fantasies? Even the question itself had grown too feeble, too distant from reality. Lamb, I am chief executive. I am sitting at the top, and every living human being below wants my head on a pike. The only reality is left in a constant shrinking list. As everything else had been thrown into the pyre, I thought I had found the antidote to all our woes, until those people smashed it to pieces. I thought what had worked for me would work for them all, until all that remained was an old man hunkering down upon his liar's chair. I thought and thought, made assumptions after assumptions, or perhaps those were never an assumptions. Just another vol of excuses and a long line of many no excuses can save Guangdong from herself now. My skull was a cavern of boiling lead, plunging towards the surface of the desk. The only testament to my existence was the following pains of pain on my jaw. The proof that despite everything, there remains one undeniable reality in this world, me, Ibuka Masaru, president of the Fushisu Limited, as real as are his fears, nightmares, his loss of Tokyo, te Tokyo Telecommunications, and the lengths he gone to bring it back. The pain clawing up the Fushisu ladder was real, too fresh, and etched too deep into my palm to be an excuse. I am real in this. Uh, I can still test too for as long as I'm alive, or can I? I turned my squinted eyes to the window, and once again away from slipping into nothingness, in that fleeting, unmistakable second, I heard the clock strike five, and I bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hey, O King of Ashes. By the way, <coughs> mm, uh, Ma Chi Yui uh, knocked twice on the door in the dilapidated apartment complex, waiting for the appointed five second underneath the flickering ceiling lamp. There was no response. I come bringing a gift, Ma knocked three times, pausing between the second and third times. Our mother sends his regards to her long lost uncle. Another five seconds. Another door opened with a pair of hands quickly sweeping Ma inside the darkened space. Eight had arrived before him. A uh, crew of unkempt and suited, suit stained men and women carrying what weapons they had with bandaged arms. A few cots and chairs were only the signs of habitation room or otherwise filled with crates of firebombs, fire, firearms, and loose ammo. Is anyone else coming, Ma asked. Similar shook their heads. Uh, assembly looked, shook their heads. It was already 30 minutes past the des designated time for the celebrated group. Fifteen went out today, and only nine came back, going to address the group, injecting what force and authority she could into her words as she gestured to the weapons littering the room. We're going to take shifts to sleep and prepare tomorrow's delivery. It's the same as every other day. It doesn't matter if you or I despair tomorrow, because tomorrow, tomorrow there'll be more of us. Hey, more power efficiency. <coughs> so when can we uh, dismantle them? Divert resources away, huh? Suicide is painless. Chief, uh, Peter Lee Chief looked ahead, his eyes gazing downwards. He let a small breath. How does this happen? The bloody mess which gazed upon un upwards from the slab gave no response. Instead, the mortician next to the captain raised his eyes to the clipboard. The deceased spirits have been the target of severe blood force trauma, and multiple lesions and lacerations were found across the body, which may have contributed to the cause of death, however, yes? The mortician raised the right, the right wrist of the chief, to whom it resembled little but pancake layers of dry blood. Incision across main artery caused fatal blood loss, likely made with an improvised blade of some form, though we have been unable to recover the weapon. Luckily, the cause is fellow inmates, so whether this was a murder and euthanasia is unclear. So you're saying we couldn't catch who did it? The whole block's being interrogated, but it'll take some time. The chief put it hand to his head. I see. Get that thing out of here. Discreetly ask the mortician. It won't matter. They already know. They already know. Concrete shoes. Sure, Sam said the man in the dark in unit safe house. I put him in from the river myself. He's gone, the woman opted him. Um, it's just me that will. I read this one before, so. It's failed, huh? I've read this one before, so you want to do this one, please go ahead. Come on. Bruh. So dumb. August 17th, 1959. Flash, flash. Every camera clicked from below with an echo of every step he taken from the Fujitsu Tsushinki Circus. And there he stood at the top, the newly inaugurated helmsman of the behemoth soon to be known as Fujitsu Limited, basking in the warmth of spotlights that somehow the anticipated head of euphoria never came. It was when he retreated down the stage when an also familiar silhouette drew him close to him. They remembered exactly why. A KO he scuffed at the sight. A KO, a KO, you and that never ending front of your face, pretending that you're still wrapped in those tatters you threw away, uh, threw away all those years ago. And it appears your buddy Lika Shing has designed, ordained, to bless me with his presence too. How has that new venture has been doing again? That temperature naturally was zero. And the customary how have you been's the custom occasional dry chuckles were ice cones shuttling in the cold. Then the topic said to stocks of to Akeo's claim of newfound acquaintances in the legislative council. To bouquet of flowers adorned with the barely dry walls of Chung Kong's headquarters, sent by an anonymous Zujin lady in truly unrivaled gratitude. One dagger after another behind a thinly knit veil, lunging at him to turn the pedestal beneath his feet into an altar. This is how it is, it seems. You know the cold hissed out from beneath his teeth. It truly is impressive. You two even survived TR-56, let alone claw your way back up to where you are today. You can almost feel a grip, grin creeping up his cheek. 
as all pretenses of warmth left Akeo's face, but when the cold crashed back onto him. Isn't this what you wanted? As the words flew and froze d dead in the summer air, Akeo with Levi's side turned and vanished into the abyss, leaving the prisoner of Fujitsu alone at the top under the icy gleams of the spotlight. I'm going to negotiate now. Well, we're going to negotiate with these guys. I've never done these guys first. <clears throat> well, you know what? We could try it. Let's save first real quick. Try to negotiate with this. That might be a bad idea to do that. But hey, we'll see. Or maybe we won't see. Thirty five percent. Cutting a deal. Well, if it ends right, I thought it ended a book of monsters mind more than a few times when the entire government scrambled to get deal with the worst of crisis in Guangdong's history. It was initially a volume, just above a whisper, but it grew ever louder as it became increasingly clear that the rise would not magically disappear. It was remarkably tempting. They would have to make some concessions to the protesters, of course, which could prove troublesome, but hopefully they would only be minor ones, and then all the chaos would be over and business could return to normal. Despite the very late hour, many of the government's highest officials were then huddled in the office to discuss the matter. They put on brave faces, though. Though their slashed shoulders and slightly dripped heads, one could tell they were all exhausted. The chief executive addressed one of them. Go over it again, Igarashi, one more time. Masato, the Igarashi Masato. The government's designated negotiator should sign and clear his throat. Yes, of course. Once we begin negotiations, the protesters will expect that we come to some sort of agreement with him. But it will be critical that we get this right the first time. They'll probably not get a second chance. Ultimately, the decision is up to you, chief executive. Should we begin negotiations? I'm mean, taking this doesn't make sense for us because we're just, we don't care about them. But we can give them some minor concessions, maybe. But we could still just. Pulling through with our vision, so. Apologize. Individual accountability. Make amends. Maybe not. Maybe we do this one later. We should just tr try to dismantle them, maybe. I don't know. We could probably try to just dismantle them. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I will read about flays, maggots, and parasites. By the Emperor's divine ancestors, what do these legions even want anymore? Haven't those idiots whose traitors and ingrates managed to forge new identities for themselves under my rule? Are they not satisfied with everything I've given to them? No, they don't want me, then I don't want it them. Then go to effing to heck, the sons of guns, a swine. <clears throat> There's only one way of going about it. The very concept of letting Chinese barbarians in order to Guangdong society know my Guangdong society was a gosh darn mistake. I'll beat the GFT into the ground and show no mercy. It's the only means I've got to fix this cock up. It's always their fault. It always is. I should have known. I should have seen it coming a mile away. I was never just a KO and a degenerate or a monster shooter. And a sycophants. No. The stench of idiocy and torture goes for on forever and ever. From the legislative council, complex all the way to the average boardroom. Japanese community is more like Japanese pig dens. But no matter. The rot runs deep, but Fujitsu's tentacles run deeper. If none of these people give a darn, flying darn about Guangdong's future, then I don't see why I should care about theirs. All their livelihood, all their job security can go in the trash for all I care. But, Mr. Chief Executive, what about my mountains of paychecks and hoarding goodies? Easy. How about you stop staining this earth with your stupid filth? I quite am a cow. Um, uh, Fong breathed a uh, relief as he punched the air. Punched in for his night shift, not being wordlessly to the security of the desk before trading his street clothes for his own uniform. Even if he had to hurry through the few checkpoints, he managed to avoid the worst of the street clashes, melting into the background before attracting the attention of either the protesters or the police. He took up the sound position outside the two warehouses, facing the waterfront, and an unremarkable corner of one of Macau's por cargo ports. Guangdong's nightly chaos seemed utterly remote here, an oasis of calm surrounded by water fencing and corporate security, which suited Fang just fine. He reached for the flashlight hanging from his belt, only to think better of it. She was supposed to patrol the warehouse every hour, but his legs were still sore from the circuitous route he'd taken to avoid the worst protests. He even set for a cigarette and lighter. There was always time for one smoke before work. With a deafening roar and a flash of scorching heat, Fung was slammed into the pavement as the warehouse erupted into flames. Entering lingering soreness, his body was swiftly replaced by a searing pain, courtesy of the glass shards slicing into his arms and legs, making it impossible to stand. Groaning, Fung rolled onto his back, hoping that the pain would keep his dimming consciousness from slipping away. He could barely make out a Hitachi logo on the surviving wall section. He didn't recall who owned the second warehouse. You could hear the fire sirens in the distance, even though they never seemed to grow louder. The pain was mercifully fading, quiet forevermore. Standard conduct. Chen frowned as the vehicle came to roll and stop. His ne job never became easier, as some of his comrades had claimed, but it certainly became routine. Stepping out of the police car, Chen surveyed the target, another concrete apartment block with narrow windows letting in the smallest amount of newly early morning sun. Joining his partner at the entrance, he prepared his usual performance, raising his riot shield. He followed his allies and breached in the building. Everyone get down and shut it on the ground now. The same fearful man of faces complied. Dri <coughs> excuse me, driving to the floor with practice precision. The officers waited behind him, 
Enter the lobby and secure the prone civilians as they move forward. Another three digit number, forgotten immediately, let their targets home. Another small flap. Same three narc sharp knocks and coarse shouting revealed a disheveled man who just awoken. Another agent named quickly forgotten, condemned by the last Chen and barely read. Seizing the man by, by his arms, Chen watches his partner restrain the family, whose typical pleas inspired a little tension. They also shuffled out of the complex like automata, releasing the civilians on the sidewalk while Chen pulled the target into the street. Opening the door of his van, Chen threw the man in the dark armored vehicle filled with other disheveled men before slamming the door shut. Returning to the driver's seat, Chen glanced at the next address on the list before accelerating out of the lot, the rest of the convoy falling behind. Chen sighed, looking out of the gray streets he had traveled dozens of times before, as they were now slowly illuminated by the rising sun. Another day, another rest, another report. And by the gate of the committee. So if you don't know this one, we, I, I said instead of negotiate, we're going to dismantle them. So we're going to attempt to dismantle them. So if you want to read about this one, please go ahead. I've done this before. So I, I'm going to say we're going to go with the RS Connections and investigate local communities. December 9th, 1956, Dearest Takeo. Only one single half sentence crawled off from the tip of his pen before he stopped in his tracks for the sixth or seventh time in the past 30 seconds. How long had it been since he had rode back to the home islands and since when it had become such a chore, he couldn't tell. I'd be so happy, so happy if you could ever see this letter. Dad's just writing to us, check if you've been okay, that's all. The pen froze again, wrapped in the tremors of his hand that would never stop. She was your crucifix, Masaru, your star of hope, and it took 12 whole months for it to register in your head. You sure didn't just forget about her like you did at Tokyo Telecommunications. God, took your father away from you, now you're taken away from hers too. That made... That makes two more souls on this earth with a crack in their hearts. Wonderful. I just want you to know everything's been fine. Daddy's out here doing his best to create a bright future, and both for myself and for many, many more people. A future where everyone gets to be their best and their best alone. A future that would have been yours until the god darn fever took it all. A future forever sealed away by the emptiness in your eyes and that I had to try so, so hard to just to bring back to you. The pen finally fell with a thud. The chasm between his eyelids wetted and wetted until the stains on the paper melted into one giant gray blob, and that's why I wanted to give it to you give it to them all, to all those people. I want to give them what you never had, and they wouldn't listen. He, and he chuckled. Tried. Clearly didn't try hard enough, or he would have, wouldn't have entertained the thought of leaving her behind. Wouldn't have run off thousands of miles away to the middle of nowhere with nothing to offer but a tiny, flickering, selfish dream about to be snuffed out of any second now. And for that, I'm sorry. Love. The crappiest dad ever. Oh boy. <clears throat> all the king's horses observing the overlooked. If you know this, please go ahead. <coughs> he was a very lucky man, they kept saying. A couple of false streets inserted in a month out to Pasha, and he was finally able to move around almost like he used to. Just a while longer to the hospital, and he'd be back out of this, back to work. His stay, his stay had been even been free, courtesy of Fujitsu, which was good. Even with his paycheck, he couldn't want to imagine his family struggling with the medical debt he'd created. The more he saw, the more he it seemed he helped out. He helped cause enough strife for his family already. Weeks upon weeks have passed, and the situation in the streets showed no sense of stopping. It was amazing how tedious carnage could become, even after all this being its direct victim, when subjected to days upon days on TV. Between the fuzzy cathode ray tubes image and the distance both Japanese and Cantonese language reporters put between themselves and the crowds, the faces all seemed to be blurred together. But even then, to the, between the smoke and the static, he kept glancing glimpses of his brother. He could tell whether these were genuine sights or mere projection of an overactive mom, but it doubted it mattered anyways. His parents had both been there to see him, why had seen him, and Chon was no but Chon was nowhere to be found, his whereabouts unknown, officially anyway. He didn't have to have to learn that all he had to figure out was he was either in the heart of the storm or six feet under. Once again, <clears throat> in case upon his vision application, the sheet, printed in bilingual Japanese and captain, he seemed to fade into formless ink whenever he stared at it. That's what he would wanted, right? There, here was a key to a brighter feature for himself and those he loved. The current situation could continue forever, surely, but that was what they had said two weeks ago, and yet it went. On and on and on. Did he deserve this? Was this the destruction of a cage he'd helped to build, one he was so trapped in? Had he truly recovered, or had he simply arrived into a heck of his own making? He lay back down in his bed, staring at the ceiling, and thought of nothing. At least strength is pretty low. Our economy's collapsing still, but whatever. Un 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 rather unfriendly community. <clears throat> A recent operations of infiltrating the local community groups have proven more difficult than initially expected. With some of our playing clothes authors managed to successfully apply for membership into these organizations, the acquisition of any solid evidence has only been challenging best, practically impossible due to the extreme measures applied by these groups to police their own members. Challenge questions and passwords are among the obstructions our agents had to face, resulting in a few of them having lost their cover and being forced to exfiltrate empty handed. If you want to continue reading this one, please go ahead. I read this one before, so. Numbers are going down, which is good, but happy January, everybody. Or February. An unfriendly or lack of uh, faith. <coughs> uh, let's see. I think I read this one before. Maybe, maybe not. 
The recent bombing of an Imperial Trade Bureau in Hong Kong was an unfortunate consequence of the investigation of sluggish pace, which resulted in not only the death of several key functionaries and civilians, but also the receipt of a grave communique from the commanders of the local Japanese garrison who have grown doubtful in a discreet approach to the dismantling of the CCL. They believe that a campaign has already proven fruitless, and have gone to suggest that we substitute for a stronger, harsher response against the looming threat. <clears throat> While it's not in our position to question the authority of the Imperial Army, we do however wish to report that we may be on the brink of a breakthrough in our intelligence gathering, should you grant us your approval and continue the ongoing infiltration assignment. So we'll require a little more time in order to properly organize the data on these groups. Continue the mission. July 18th, 1955. Where are you going? <clears throat> the listless inquiry sprung up like a rope and almost tripped over him in his suitcase. He turned around as always. Sekiko was sitting there and always, always. He felt his face morphing to match hers. Two mirrors opposite one another, nothing left between them than an infinity of indifference. Ah, it's a KO, he said. As if on command, the black and white TV in the center of the room crackled back to life with the same fanfares had done again and again for the past 24 hours. <clears throat> Today, Sonus Lee Electronics unveiled itself to the world upon the Pearl River Delta, poised to be the pioneer of the future of a generation beyond. Brought to you is the TR-56 transistor radio, quite possibly the first of its kind for mass civilian's commercial use. As expected of him, really. The noise almost drowned out his faint chuckle. A man who always made something out of the hand he was dealt. We may have stolen the fruits of our labor, but he will not take the spotlight. With this, he has started his stride. I'll be staying overnight in the company from now on to negotiate his relocation to Akoshu. Working out the divorce papers and informing your father, we'll have to do it in the scrap time. I'm sure he'll, un under he'll understand. <clears throat> so you're leaving me in little Matoko, Makoto behind like this then? What about Takeo? <clears throat> he stopped, sighing, and turned once more to the hours where nothing seemed to happen, where the marriage, and the marriage that only seemed to end in farewell. Was it her fault, or was it his? Probably? I've come all this way in my life, he spoke one last time, his back against the light. Might as well do things I want to do for once. So please, let me. It was a slightly cold morning. The pattern shaping. <coughs> After extensive investigation and data gathering by our agents, we were able to properly identify several key figures within the hierarchy of these community groups, mainly lieutenants and organization commissars that are considered instrumental to the plots. Furthermore, uh, we were able to construct a sizable map pinpointing multiple caches owned by these groups, where they stash money, weapons, propaganda, other supplies across the three paroles. Finally, we made a breakthrough. However, this evidence has, alone is not enough to solidify a link between the community groups and the CCL, which requires us to continue the investigation until that link can be properly established. We have two operations on standby awaiting your approval. We can wiretap the communications and examine the transcripts for suspicious exchanges, or we can send officers to tail after the merchandise being held by these groups. Once we receive your orders, the operation will begin immediately, and we'll begin reporting again once we made our findings. Calls. Follow the goods. They have, like, no strength, which is good. And we're looking okay here. A little bit of corruption, but whatever. So, security status, tenuous. Do not circulate. Um, if you want to read about this one, please go right ahead. <coughs> Bang for buck. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> excuse me. Oof. Twelve examples. <clears throat> Procured and delivered by clandestine affairs personnel from purported CCL armories. <coughs> Overview. The explosive potential of the community of Chinese labor is growing at an alarming pace. Where previous estimations uh, suggest CCL use of improvised explosive devices as confined to sporadic use and prone to malfunction or premature detonation, this assumption is no longer tenable. While clearly constructed in non-specialist facilities, these devices bear a level of sophistication and payload comparable to paramilitary organizations such as the Northeastern Anti-Japanese United Army. Please view attached document for further technical information. It is believed that figures that with an advanced knowledge of munitions may be assisting urban insurgents. Conclusions. The potential consequences of exposing the stockpiles currently in possession of the CCL um, being used in further attacks cannot be understated or allowed. Special branch commanders are recommend to seriously consi consider the benefits of continued proximity to CCL leadership against the cost of leaving stockpiles in place. <clears throat> Consul General Takashima strongly recommends swift intervention. Tokyo has little patience for dithering nor failure. Kicking the door. Go, go for it. The spirit is extremely high. Nice. A banger or a whimper? I read this one before, so. Um, we received one of the required clues needed before we can strike the CCL. If the government controls the underworld, we need two to proceed, or else we need three. So. If you want to this one, please go ahead. We're getting there. Look at that. Um, if you want to this one again, please go ahead. October 22nd, 1954. The pile of grass was practically spat on the desk. Perfectly average, perfectly inadequate. That was all his pet project of yours amounted to. It was nobody's pet project. He found himself muttering and glancing over his shoulders at Ikeda. At all other stone cold masks upon the stone cold chairs. Every person in this room had a hand in bringing the Falcon 100 to this world, Mr. President. At least give them some credit. Doesn't matter, Boom 
<clears throat> called Unico's voice. You chose to ignore our lessons from 51 and sink money into that bum screw nowhere by the South China Sea again. You choose chose to run this already lackluster sales campaign into the ground, all while having exactly zero idea what you're doing. And to think I counted on you to save the company, the man leaned in. <clears throat> you know, sometimes I wonder if Jiu-Jitsu would be better without you. I said, saying, sure, sir. Marketing flop, you say. Maybe you should have th thrown a KO out then while we're at it. Then maybe you should have taken me in, in the first place. I don't even want anything to do with those computers, all those reductionists, fancy new toys, stripping away what makes life life. I wasn't counted on to do jack squat for this thankless job. I wasn't forced to. Maybe it'd be better without, without me anyways. And yet, the air stirred. First fluid, Ikeda Toshio, shuffling towards him under a cold, stup stupefied glare. Then another, then another, before long half the conference room had gotten his back without a word. And so I could hear them loud and clear. Masaru's right, they said. Guangdong had potential, so please give it a chance. Give Masaru a chance. The stone-cold master no more. Instead, a curious warmth gushed across his face. Then again, really wasn't here to save his company, no. He was here to claim it as his own. Dragon Man for questioning? Dragon Protesters for questioning? Uh, let's wait for Hierarchy to merge. Right, we're going to do this in Plitzgood. We're going to go over the Hierarchy. That'll be for the best. Sins of the father and husband. We've investigated the captain's background and discovered that the man had a wife and son, both suspected of showing sympathetic sentiments to the CCL cause. If not directly involving with the ongoing riots, once their domicile is located, we'll quickly dispatch officers to apprehend the two and bring him into the adjacent room to the interrogation chamber to demonstrate. To the prisoner that are threat is far from a mere bluff, as expected, the shock upon the captain's visage means that we now have our leverage. Interrogators have assured the prisoner that the family would not be into question bar man, but they have been given to the camp by tie if he further attempted to withhold the truth. They did not take long for the captain to finally relent, and we're currently jotting down all important information gathered from this breakthrough. As for the son and wife, they'll be remaining in custody until the crisis is resolved, but we've made a compromise on that they may share the same cell per the captain's request. You're the strongest men of the weaknesses, so we uh, did the whole thing where the, um, we talked about trying to find people, and then we found this guy, and we're like, oh, well, how can we break him? Just exploit his wife and his son. That's all. August 21st, 1952. So I suppose, welcome home, in every sense of the word. Boom, and Mr. May does alcohol lead in voice by, the, by his ear. Somehow, though, it failed miserably to blast his attention away from the wavering lanterns, the thump of drums and kotos, and the swirling chattering. Dancing a human mass of a yukata, yukatas all around him. He saw a civilian and Furukawa employee alike, listening in exultation, relief from the years of hard labor, living the day His Majesty Emperor Taisho had dined his petty town with his presence. Thirty years of the Niko Waraku Odori. Thirty years of spectacle in the place where he was born, yet never got to see it once for himself. This, he tilted the sake bottle away from his mouth and gazed at the drunken faces before him with yet sober eyes. He knew, for all intents and purposes, he should thank these people for the occasion. Mr. Ameda, who had been there when Tokyo Tele struggle would take off, Higuchi Akira, who had been there since their Nippon Kolon days, even Ikeda Toshio, would at least welcome him with a smile on his face if only Ikeo had been there too. Welcome home to Furukawa, he's told, surrounded by faces old and new. Tomorrow's worries can wait for tomorrow. Today we live in the moment. By the way, wasn't that the one dormitory building over there? Can you care to pay your birthplace a visit? His lips fluttered. The town of Nico, in fact, had been a ghost to him. A floating specter waving at him from his mother's bedtime stories as had been the towering, gleaming figure of the man. The model engineer. The aspiring Furukawa employee. The man who built a hydroelectric dam on a hill. The man who, like him, bore the name Ibuka. Whisked away from this world before he could remember his face. If his father had stayed for one more year than three, perhaps it, they could have... They would have shared a memory together. Gone to the Waraku Odori together, and anything that wasn't a distant reconstruction. But that's a life. That's life, right? Right? People come and go, and all you get to do is move on. He turned to Mr. Medea and nodded. He wanted to reach out to that ghost, if only for one last time. Yeah, father? Mother? I'm home. Got a lot of political power from that last focus. So we're just kind of hanging out. He's still smiling, though. We have a cup of lemon tea here, too, to keep us nice warm. It is very, very hot at the time of this recording. Happy March 1st, everybody. Happy March. One step ahead. Hmm. Let's see. In the conference room of the Guangdong Police Academy, or agency, the brass concerned with the recent riots had gathered a report on the findings of the interrogation. Spirits were generally high. The uncharacteristically nervous disposition of the senior commissioner had vanished, and a stern and confident demeanor returned. The superintendent general was also feeling happier, though he didn't show this outwardly. There was work to be done. A superintendent in charge of one of the detention centers was given a summary of the findings. The evidence was overwhelming. I'm afraid it's very clear to us what's being planned, the superintendent said. It's a major disruption along some of the most important transport hubs in Guangdong, both the three pros and the regional cities. It would be a huge economic blow to the co-prosperity sphere to succeed. The senior commissioner uh, nodded. At least we were ahead of them for once, and just in time it seems. I don't want to speak out of turn, but a disruption of the scale could affect the autonomy of Guangdong itself if the mainland becomes concerned. Superintendent General shot him a look at an accusing glare, but said nothing. The senior commissioner continued, assuming the best conditions, we essentially have two ways of acting. 
either set up extra security details outside of the major airports and ports, or focus again on interrogations. The major uh, concern with the first plan of action is that we run the risk of tipping out the CCL, but it can be good to prevent a disruption of the scale. Return of the interrogations would give us more time and more information to act on. Men mulled their options for a while, and the natural conclusion eventually revealed itself. Increase security. You have to increase security. Like, you, you just have to. You just have to. Tipping your ham. Maybe you're this one, please go ahead. <coughs> Feel free and go to our new office, would you? From 1952, uh, February 17th. He heard himself mutter, I need another look around before we leave for good. It might be, it might take some time. Then he pursed his lips shut and braced himself with all somber handshakes and somber hugs. Higuchi, Takichak. Uh, Tachikawa, Mr. Medea, all the other four, eight people that were all up to Tokyo to, uh, Communications, himself included. He felt the warm wetness in their eyes, but he dared not return their gaze, so he screwed his eyelids shut until he heard the faint gentle click of the door. And then he was alone, alone in the final tour of the office where the two dreamers had dwelled. His feet were moving on their own, his hands too, as they traced across the empty bookshelves, cr across the lone foam model of the G type recorded by his side, across the suffers of surface of a chaos desk and then his own. Across one hollow relic after another, all to be sealed away by the February cold, except something already wasn't here. A lingering pe presage guided his hand to the drawer beneath the cupboard to the resting place of their last project together when it all come crashing down and now of knobs, buttons, and circuit boards, he pulled the drawer open. Nothing. So that weird parting glare wasn't the only thing Akeo had taken with him after all. He felt his hand flinch and then he felt nothing too. Darn it, Akeo, his lips open. Why would you quit it, Masaru? You know darn too well why he did it. You made him. It's all your fault. His gaze remained frozen in the vacant drawer for a solid ten seconds. Then he chuckled. That's only natural. He supposed Akeo needed a, a nice little souvenir to keep along the way. A souvenir of regrets. Um, I think I was some before, but great, uh, China can be allowed to interfere, so have a great effect on how we deal with them. Mm. Let's see. We're about to be starved of oxygen. Can we do it? Can we do it? Once bustling, not silent. If you wanted this one, I read this one before. If you wanted this one, please go ahead. And we were successful. It only gets worse. Have you heard what the Foreign Affairs Ministry has been up to? Came Mikhail's careless voice. He stopped. The afternoon caressed his, son, his face. Come again? The following went through with carving out Guangdong yesterday after heaven knows how many back and forths in service of special Pan Asian interests. Mikhail shrugged, whatever the heck that means, as he stood. As the running waters below the Nihon Bashi filled his ears, I wouldn't say no to a clean start he began. For the two of us, I mean, new markets, new materials. We can always move it over. It ends up too crowded here in the home islands. Masaru, please. Okay, I'll smirk, grew into a smile, then a laugh. I get what you want to break new ground. We both do, but remember right now, we're barely keeping the company afloat as is. You surely put it all on the line a second time? I Haven't I told you? As far as I'm concerned, I've only got 50 years on this planet, he blurted out. I want to make something out of him. That, do all that I could, however short it might be. You know very well, Akio, that I... I don't think you understand my question. Then that smile was gone. So it was the river, the bridge, the sun, what remembered... A remained a post-war Tokyo. The cotton white hair grew back onto a kale. As is a never-ending frown, are you sure you want to risk everything you have? Everything you love? Everything you care about for the sake of your dream? Then all floated back, the empty drawer, the TV set, the courts, the spotlights, the metal touch of the microphone at his inaugural dress. The row after row of bulldozers and the chrome-draped citadel sprouting out in their wake. The opium dens, the skeletal hands, the fires, yells, screams, an old man alone in his wreckage of an office. The mango corpse of the nation laid bare before his eyes. Twenty years later, he booked a monster smile and gave his answer. I am. Nothing shall stand in my way. No more. There's always another way. Those days with the KO and the Tokyo Telecommunications. If only I could return to those without the misery of the millions on my mind. Nothing shall stand in our way. Oh, crap. <clears throat> Rupture. Rapture. Four months, four months, six. Quite frankly, I've lost count altogether how long it's been going on. It seems those morons have lost count, too. Seeing how they're perfectly fine with keeping things the way they are. It sounds good to me. The time for tolerance is over. Starting today, all forms of dissent, unrest, and treachery are to be liquidated on site. They don't deserve my fortune, or future. They don't deserve a single gosh darn thing. Forgive me, Guangdong, for I have failed you. Enough. No more compromises, no more half measures, no more facilitating. Facilitating. Guangdong will be exactly as I will it. We will decree no negotiation with the rioters, which we kind of already did, so. Actually, since we before we do that, what do we, what do, we do here? We could, but it's only money, right? Here we go. <coughs> Sky cracks. I've gotten so much information from these dudes over the past few months of riots and disorder. Now that I'm going to put it to good use, I'll go and stick in every single armed man in Guangdong in this illiterate. It's no hard, no bolt holds barred. <clears throat> 
Send in the security officers, the police, the militia, heck, even the uh, stupid camp I tie. If the IJ won in, they're welcome. I don't give a crap anymore. Ride these traitors down until they learn their place. No need for me to, or them to show restraint or kindness. Give them a quarter. Show no mercy. Keep attacking until these ingrates obey my will. If not, well, I'm not responsible for the consequences. I don't know about this one. Please go ahead. Bit more corruption, huh? Well, how much do we have? Only 3%. Lockdown. Overnight, the city appeared to double to weight in concrete. Uh, traffic came to a halt, and work went unfinished. Subway tunnels came empty, their mouths held under lock and key. Across the major roads, in the space between neighborhoods, the roadblocks stood, bases heavy enough to stop the vehicles dead, with barbed wire tall enough to repel men on foot, at the very least, assuming they came unarmed. <clears throat> oh, I said this one. Oh. There's another case in all locations, nor could the police hope to be everywhere. Perceived weaknesses were quickly spotted, and attempts to break through were made. The fence hour proved less fragile than the thin chain mail mesh appeared at first, and the concrete was predictably immovable. Commercial power tools began to cut through, but a pace intolerable to the enraged masses, many who had previously not been part of the riots, and while some posts had been left unmanned, none of them left observed. As soon as they appeared, the drills and cutters were soon abandoned, and as those wielding them were sent away or cut down. <clears throat> Siren p patrols sped through their sun areas, making observations as they went. The cells were isolated, exposed, the cages locked tight. All that remained was to determine exactly where in the vast concrete landscapes of urban Guangdong the heads of the snake lay, and then to bury them to have concrete swallow them whole, tighter and tighter. Cycle of life. Name Tin Xiong Hong. Position Vice Assistant and Relief Coordinator of Pan Yong of the Committee of Chinese Labor. Well, the look at his back. Officer LC049 saw you on live TV yesterday. Promotion of the Pan Yu Chief of Police and All. Looks like the 10 year old blow job finally played off. Give me the names. Names? I saw you in the alley, mowing them down with that Nambu without the blink of an eye. They're dead, Officer Lam. All 27 of them. All thanks to you. All the names left in my brain are 27 dead people, and you wanted more? What the heck am I supposed to do? Make crap up? Then you've exhausted your use to us for the time being, Ah Fong. Take him back to the detention cells. Screwers like this been uh, like this for a week now. I see, but hey, before I head to the gals like my boss did, I suppose I should tell you one more secret that I want off my chest and out of my grave. We did blow up that tram with the seven children in Hong Kong all those years ago, and I did, in fact. I'd never regretted it since. Battle of the Junction. They're throwing us into the dens. We rushed to CC all the raids. Um, yeah, I've heard this one before, so if you remember this one again, please go ahead. Oh. They're throwing us into the dance. Oh crap. Right at the edge. Um, it wasn't quite the coast of myth and postcard, but you can see it from Ng Hoi Song's little store. Gray, gray slabs in the distance eerily faded at the edge of the horizon. Small twinkles of light danced from them at night, the message of the noble alien stars. If one turned right and walked down the road a little, one would see the remnants of all that once been. Most abandoned, all decrepit, but there nonetheless. Moss laden, partially reclaimed, connected only by the thin dirt roads, the survival of even their bones felt like a quiet miracle of only for the sanctity of the dead. Mm, still own world stood between the two, never quite fitting into both. The tinkle mess of impoverished architecture standing amidst rows of dingy five-story courtyards apparently built to rot. Ning bought the bags of rice from the surviving farmers and sold them packs of batteries for the raiders in return. She paid the right people protection. They went one way, went away one day. She paid a different set of, set of the right people. The government dragged people off to the factories now and then, but she'd been lucky so far. Hong Kong, the place they were theoretically a part of, didn't care much about them, so a little mine had been paid in return. Until a few weeks ago. The delicate balance of violence Ning had relied on was... Uh, broken by the arrival of a large group of desperate looking people from the inner city. Many armed and all with hair triggered tempers, the lockdown came, and the dwindling pile of stock became thinner, and flights over the counter became a daily encounter. Even after the bus full of police followed, now she cowered until un under a counter. As police and the exiles chased and spied each other through the border's territory's uncertain streets, wrecking them as they came, she prayed for it to end, and soon, just now with a bullet or knife, please. Alright, grasp. <clears throat> An autonomous unit command of the police force? Nonsense. I've got absolutely no need for such things. Why exactly do these blue shirts have to function outside of my control? Don't they understand that Fujitsu is Guangdong and Guangdong is Fujitsu? I'll subsume the police into the Fujitsu Limited, making it just another unit of my militias. It's better this way. Things work faster and be more efficient. All the better to shut these ungrateful riders up for good. Ah, the invisible hand. I've gotten so much information from these dudes over the past few months of riots and disorder. I can put it to use to stick every armed man in Guangdong on them, and yes, but there's something else I can do that's even better. I'll order every single corporation in Guangdong to lay off every single individual even remotely associated with those darn riots. It'll leave them with no means of subsistence, you say? Good. It's more or less than the, what they deserve. Nice. Very nice. 
Your huddle masses. Oh, whoa. See so you take a sharp turn to the right, heading into the Fukuoka Avenue. A snap second later, the blue lights are bound into his mirror. As they've done consistently for the last little kilometers, the fans part of seem to extend for an infinity. A sort of contrast to and defiance of the destruction he had been witness and participant to these last few weeks. And he's, a tiny synapse in Sue's mind wondered who had been keeping the hedgerows, cl hedgerows clean in recent days, and while the rest screamed in frustration, they tried to keep the screaming cars from overtaking him. They saw at least he was at least grateful the streets were nearly empty of vehicles. <clears throat> As a rusted out ton of lead, he was cursing while driving careened its way down the avenue, he noticed a growing mass of people huddled around one of the fenced off palatial style buildings. Something else to avoid crap. The car skirted off to the curb, right, right curb, leading to a sharp jolt of displeasure. Everything was getting closer, and the picture became more and more clear, something almost resembling a line, and then a sign, and more police. Being held up by another group, military uniforms and modern looking rifles, was that the Chinese flag being hoisted above? It glanced quickly at the sign again, refuge for Chinese, it said. The figures were almost being shoved through the gate several at a time, could it be? So you looked around and see the pigs gaining no more time to think, this might just be crazy enough to work. He veered to the elderly Nissan left, towards the crowd, waited for the cops to follow, then turned right, stepped hard on the accelerator. Good thing he never wore a seatbelt, he thought, opened the door and dived out of the speeding tr vehicle. The impact broke his arm instantly, maybe a rib, and blacked out for a couple seconds, but in those two seconds, the uniformed man had grabbed him and drove him safe into the protective arms of the Chinese Consul General. Certainly one way to make an entrance. Oh boy. Cleaning the air. <clears throat> the only light in the back room came through the small cracks of the door, uh, casting little but orange wisps. The CCL cell sat in darkness and silence, breathing in recycled human fumes. Missing Hong Kong's air quality for the first time in their lives, the worst aspect of the city's humidity. Some managed to linger even as their skin dried and the lisps cracked. No to eat for hours, nor did they expect to eat for hours more, a fact that made increasingly bitter by the crates upon crates of dried food they shared within the room. We need to move, has a voice in the corner. Where to? Gosh darn pigs are everywhere. They'll have us in a cell in the second we poke our noses out. The sounds of insects and vermin uh, scurrying up, punctuate the silence. The prospect of their touch was not something that could be cast away, save for hope and prayer. A shrill laugh came from the, behind the aisle. Oh, you think they'll arrest us? That's hilarious. They're following our every move. We're dead already. I don't know about you, but I've got no intention of suffocating on your farts. Someone raised their hands to their head, nor did they. It was not quite pitch black, but just bright enough to give those inside the deluded impression of sight. Go on, then, but don't make us kill ourselves for you. We just have to be patient. For what? To be killed an hour later? I want my last meal to be something other than dehydrated, dehydrated onions, thank you. Said dehydrated onions later to the floor next to a small pile of phlegm and vomit. Will both of you shut up? They'll hear, this is the police. Open up. No. Under all blaze, huh? Weeks of rage. You try to pimp and cheat us. Monday, firebomb exploded outside Ponyu District, 12 wounded, but you can never beat us. Tuesday, armed clash between protesters and police until leaving 30 dead, hundreds wounded. What the heck? This is stupid. Um, you thought you could defeat us. Wednesday, coordinated arson attacks targeting Jabs minor majority settlements across Guangdong, unknown dead and injured. That death was here to greet us. Thursday, five camp officers found dead hanging off Pearl Rubber Bridge. The phrase missed me, carved into the torsos. That, that none were here to lead us. Fire a car bomb explodes outside of Koshu Central Police Headquarters, causing significant damage to building and personnel, but you can never beat us. Saturday, running battles day and night between insurgents and security forces, damage presently incalculable. No, you cannot defeat us. Send it back to the drawing board. Failed to sufficiently weaken the CCL. This is BS. This is absolute BS. Are you kidding me? Look at their strength. Look at their strength. Zero percent. Zero percent. Are you freaking kidding me? What a bunch of crap. I'm sorry, but this is, this is turning to becoming really incredibly stupid. Incredibly stupid. Our little secret. Well, you know what? We failed them. Well, we're going to do these guys next. If you want to about all the king's men, please go ahead. I don't want to read that anymore. Oh, how'd you like that, you stupid animal? Screamed after a Fune Yoshi, slamming his body against the wall and headbutting it, not noticing the gory residue secrete itself across the helmet and drip onto his forehead. He pummeled the corpse again and again. He'd lost a baton in this melee, allowing him to the primal joy of feeling his own flesh destroy enemy flesh. He put a tap on his back and swung around with a savage punch, nearly missing his surgeon. For stupid sakes, Kaisu, it's over. The dude's dead. You can stop now. Funny Yoshi paused as they surveyed the room, his heart breathing or threatening to break free of its own pr prison. Bodies led to the small room against one wall, the body of an officer slumped, arms clutched with a blade stuck in his throat. On the opposite wall, a stuffed Chinese man, or cuffed Chinese man, let a gurgling giggle sound through cracked and bloody teeth. At least, Funny Yoshi assumed the animal was giggling. Your friends are all dead, he thought, and you're laughing. The faster the army comes in to call you vermin, the better. The officers who remain stand, sitting paused, look at another. Call an ambulance or get her wounded out of here, said the sergeant. What about the prisoners? asked Funny Yoshi through gritted teeth. It's a gosh darn shame, I think, Kaisuke. Said the surgeon, pulling out a matchbox. They all claim they want a change of freedom. And what do they do? Destroy their own buildings, their own communities. Really, that's what the animals do. Funiyoshi grinned. I couldn't agree more, sir. That's what they are. Good cop, bad cop. Uh, oh, we're back at this again. So you're going to do this? Please go ahead. 
We're not gonna get anywhere from with him. So you're gonna do this one. I've heard this one before. Please go ahead. Stick carrot. Hence the interrogator. Unforgivable go crimes. Crimes were nothing near the Guangdong police force, but even in the midst of the riots, it was greatly discovered in the heart of the city, dumped unceremoniously in front of the administrative building at dawn. Surgeon hit. Hiko Tani fought down the urge to gag the naked body. His blood and bruised extremities twisted unnaturally at every joint, where most corpses had one clear cause of death. This one had multiple blunt force trauma, excessive bleeding, multiple dislocations, drowning, and none of them were natural. Local water department reported that a certain Mr. Kano went missing a few days ago. Seeing this as their building, his lieutenant, Tamura, showed off as they finished examining the body with practice motions. What an awful way to die! Hiko Tani connected the dots mentally. Even through forensics, even though forensics would take a few hours to deliver the formal conclusion, did Kano have any enemies? Gambling deaths, lower lovers, spats, a screwed a tried woman? Nothing, Tamura replied. A man started working three months ago, fresh graduate from the home islands, didn't bring their family, no known romantic acquaintances. Worked overtime on the regular paper, or uh, worked overtime with, on regular with paperwork. Stupid, it's open season on government officials, isn't it? Only those without bodyguards, Tamura shot a haunted glance at Hiko Tani, and rumor has it they're getting desperate enough to jump those with guns too. Watch your back. This is returning. This is incredibly stupid. Oh my god. Earth trembles. What I've done is not enough. No, far from it. Now what I'm going to do something yet better. I'm going to send thousands upon thousands of bulldozers and raise every single derelict built neighborhood to the ground. It'll pay the way for better, more efficient projects in the future, but there's another bonus. It'll wipe those thrice darn hotbed of crime and potential hidey holes and meeting places for riders off the fence of this blood earth once and for all. Collateral damage is not a concern. What is important is that all those pest holes be put out of my sight and out of my mind. Not even in the face of Armageddon. <clears throat> Give them the fruit of enlightenment to the masses. And they call you the devil. F flooded four billion people off the face of the earth, and they call you God Almighty. I suppose nothing stopped me from calling myself either of these, but titles are false. Arbitrary, and if you were to do so, I would have blasphemed against the one objective truth. I was right. On this planet full of unbridled idiocy, I have myself and only myself to trust. Nobody else understands what matters. Nobody else understands what Guangdong wants. If this is the path, I'm destined to tread on my own, and so be it. I am my own person, and heck will freeze over before I am submit to the whims of others ever again. I was right because I've proven myself right. I was right because I say so. Going to us. Yep, uh, life lessons. Uh, let's see. Citizens are reminded to be on the best behavior and reporting any suspicious activity to the relevant authorities. Uh, now remember, uh, don't talk to strangers. Look both ways before crossing the road and stay away from policemen. This week, a total of eight lead leading seditionists were detained by security forces awaiting trial and punishment to the fullest extent of the law. If I'm not back by this evening, there's a rice in the cupboard. Three of the criminals are former holders of Zuzhin status, an unfortunate mistake which has been since been corrected. If I'm not back next morning, there's 100 yen for the market on the counter. The state of Guangdong reminds you that anyone, regardless of ethnicity or status, could be potentially aiding the current state of disorder or fa and failing to present known information on criminal activities, no matter how insignificant, is a serious offense. If I'm not back within the next day, Mr. Sun and Floor 27 will know what to do. Have a pleasant and productive day. Don't cry, sweetie. Mommy's going to be fine. The numbers are zero. Zero. Don't tell me that the CCL is too strong. A room without a view. I've read this before. Knocking on heaven's door. Once again, I'm ready to slam it against uh, the hot mahogany door. Once again, nothing came of it. One more useless gesture among a parent's lifetime. I know you're in there, Ibuka. How long do you think this can go on for? This is madness. How long do you think this can last? You're building nothing but your own tomb and dragging us with you. God darn it, Masaru. One more slam against the door, but the wood may have well been an iron, another wall, and another nearly 20 year of tradition by now, I'm worried to fell every single one of them as he leaned against his head against a door that was not a door. Even as no answer came, he knew work continued to pace inside, more destruction, more terror, more misery, and the dude couldn't even have the courage to face his peers as he brought death upon his own enterprise again. Just like 20 years ago, but carrying the consequences of millions instead of a handful of careers, and once again, there's nothing he could do, so ineffectually bang on a door which would not be answered. A beggar after all, it seemed. Tears formed in Marita's eyes. Marita, you need to let it go. He turned around and see Masashida. How? Oh, he's destroyed everything. Lives, our security, are his mind. His own mind. We need to act and do something. I can't stop trying. There has to be something. I never knew him the way you did, but I wager you tried enough, said Masashida, said unkindly. Not unkindly. There's nothing else we can do to stop this. We can only prepare for what's to come. He walked away, leaving Morita, still standing at the door, but saying and doing nothing. Why did it have to be this way? Because people didn't listen. Suicide is painless. My god, just let us dismantle them. There's nothing here. Of course. I think we're just being being cock blocked completely by the by the game at this point. Like there's nothing we can do. Don't cry because it's over. 
Banks uh, felt the bullet chafe inside her gut for the opportunity time, painful and tedious, and again, that had been with her whole life, hadn't it? Tedious pain, so no need to be down about it. It was ending soon, and even as all came down, she had to admit the last few weeks had been some of the happiest she'd known. Hangley Residential Facility had been an empty wreck for days now, a great complex of strip rooms, broken windows held aloft within bullet peppered walls. Not for much longer, if the demolition crew still below had anything to say about it. A bit dramatic thought fang, still up between here and the Hitachi factory, this is where the flame of a rebellion had been lit, a memory of which was to be buried, and her with it. And she could have gone with the others, but she refused. Here she was born, and here she would die. The world was silent, except for the sound, soft sounds of breeze kicking over litter and rubble. Um, it was all over now. The Japanese won this round. Maybe the world would remember this all simple flash in Japan. Perhaps it would only be a short while before nobody else spoke her name ever again. If they did, maybe she would be remembered only as a murderer and a savage, but none of that mattered. In a short period. Fang felt the world come around uh, alive her. Everywhere, people struggled and suffered, but for something other, something greater than the base instinct to survive. Every street, every punch, every bullet, every fire, every tear, every part of a grand assertion of humanity. She was all ephemeral and all dead now, but life was ephemeral. And in these four sh few short weeks, thought Fang, I was, I lived, I was. I did and became someone and something. In another time, another place, maybe something would have been different, but this was the life Fang had been given. And even as the charges finally detonated, collapsed all she had known into a concrete tomb, she did not regret a single moment, and smiled because it happened. I'm sorry, but they, it seems like the devs are just like saying no to us. It's completely no. Let's get in the committee. We're going to do the ROC this time. This is so stupid. This is so frustratingly stupid. I'm sorry. We can invest in con uh, Chinese Consul General. I guess we could try it. Make sure investors increase Japanese frustration, do despair. Old friends and new acquaintances. Um, I think there was some before in a previous campus. If you read this one, please go ahead. Can't trust anyone these days. Nope. The go betweens. <clears throat> Along with standing recent assets, or uh, affiliates and confidence of Wang Jingku, and thus the Chinese National Security Bureau follow the general plan, generally members of the Wang network are figures of modest respect within their local Chinese communities or those holding minor positions of authority. Teachers and factory foremen are the two most common professions among the circle, which is believed to be an attempt to infiltrate CCL leadership or direct their tactics. As many have ascended to suspected command positions, this appears to have been successful. Figures connected to organized crime are also present within the circle, who may be conducting acts of violence at the behest of the Chinese state, while these contacts are, are, were utilized in previous Camp Thai ROC intelligence joint operations against labor and militancy, has apparently not prevented their harmonious collaboration with the CCL. Close monitoring the residences and communications of relevant figures suggests a significant influx of both financial and material resources, which are subsequently funneled to suspect CCL mid-level leaders. With the present wealth of knowledge and information available to us, both Camp Pai and GPF leaders believe it is within a grasp to remove a sizable portion of the middle rungs of the CCL command, which they would take some time to recover from. I was only likely to grasp a portion of information required to effectively identify and neutralize CCL leadership. Perhaps, more significantly for the long term, however, we have yet to establish a direct flow of resources between insurgents and the ROC intelligence, which may pose an unconquerable threat to national security even after the final suppression of the riots. Take out the middlemen, or there's no long term. For your eyes only. I'm, I'm honestly getting tired of reading all this stuff. I really am. I've read something like this before. So. Communications. Investigate Guangdong. Butter profile. Yeah, honestly, this is just too much. Rom suspects. I've read this one before, too, but so. It's actually weighing, so this one. Simple, friendly conversation. <clears throat> The rest and subsequent interrogation of the 17 individuals suspected to be connected to the Chinese intelligence has yielded only minor results. Extensive cross-referencing, follow-up raids, and interviews of the apprehended figures all moved to admit CCL or tried involvement, has generated some actionable intelligence on CCL leadership figures. However, at present, this is insufficient to deliver a rec irrecoverable blow to military command. A solid link between the apprehended figures and the Chinese National Security Bureau is yet to be established. All arrested figures are either native to Guangdong or possess legitimate Guangdong citizenship documents, although the latter is unusual for Guangdong's settled migrant population. Many have admitted to meeting with the Wang Jiku directly, though, never more than in his official position as a political attaché to the Consul General. As all presently available as evidence towards the Republic of China's culpability is circumstantial. Remain in no position to demand evidence, nor accountability from Nanjing. It is thus recommended. 
To conduct a more thorough investigation into Chinese espionage within Guangdong in the future, although it is, unlikely, it is likely to the recent arrests will not go ignored by the National Security Bureau. At present, however, a different angle of investigation is necessary to uncover these identities of CCL leaders. Back to the drawing board. So can we dismantle them? Oh, come on. We have two clues now. Dossier, Song, Zing, Guang. You're going to do this, please go ahead. Anything of note in his previous postings? From Foreign Shores. Tense meeting. This is getting so tedious and annoying that I don't want to do this anymore. Think into the streets. I've read this one before too. Guangdong Blues. And even Guangdong Blues too. We wanted to get a hierarchy to emerge earlier, but it failed too. Familiar stomping grounds. We learn more. We failed both times against these, singling out the big fish. Let's proceed. Missing papers. I've read that one as well. Featured stake. Blast from the past, struggling revelations. Bring him in. A lead. Back to the basics. We do know little about him. Jing Ji Yu? I'm sorry, but like, I, this is so much extreme reading that, and it's important at all, but like, there's not much we can do about it at this point. What's up ahead? We did, we literally did this one earlier. A spook? Dripping her hand. We had more than enough clues earlier. Oh my god, this is such bull crap. Oh, Jesus Christ. This is so stupid. Beginning of the... What? Who gives a crap about the product cycle? This is such crap. This is honestly such crap. I hate this. The end of the Guangdong is so freaking difficult. It's not fun. It's really not fun at all. Oh, screw the Chinese. They want to rebel and do what? And do crap like this? So be it. They're dead. They're literally dead. Family ties. If you're any black, please go ahead. Spousal connections. Disturbing. Stage two. Honestly, I might just use cons commands. I'm I'm so sick and tired of this that I do much just use cons commands for this. Janet cannot be allowed to intervene. Dossier, what was the mission in Wushu? I've given up on this, kind of. My god. Doing this for over an hour and a half, almost. Work. Missing piece, you're gonna do this, please go ahead. Cold case. Prisoners. Chinese Consul General squirms under amount of pressure. Uh, I can read this one. The Republic of China's diplomatic staff have been long grown accustomed to Guangdong's watchful eye. Staff were told to avoid loud conversations with the embassy's main conference rooms, which had surely been bugged. They're coming in to recognize. <clears throat> Staff's uh, plainclothes officers, hands always on their belts. Uh, as they rode the subway, they even learned to assemble knickknacks to look for hidden cameras. All these antics were passive, however. They were sort of calculated, but all that was changing now. As the riots grew worse, the Chinese Consul General became aware of the darker and darker, more dangerous tactics. Um, the plane's closed officers no longer kept themselves in the subways, but stood menacingly outside the embassy compound. Staff found themselves unable to leave their homes, shoved violently back inside when they tried to leave. Telephone lines were cut, letters torn apart and discarded. Formal complaints were in about dwindling food, and the growing piles of waste were dismissed with a small token gestures. Stale, moldy bread, ripped garbage bags, the world which had once been expensive and overwhelming shrunk to the size of a pinprick. The Consul General watched all these things with growing alarm. It was clear the Chief Executive was no longer satisfied to play the observer, but would instead seek to have the government of China isolated and eliminated. We need to get in touch with Nanjing. If we did not act quickly, the situation might, situation might grow worse still. It might grow violent. China's Consul General squirms under mounting pressure. This is so stupid. Can we just kill them off? My god. Please. Come on. Stage 2. 
for his eyes only. It says it's greatly weaken it. That means literally nothing. That literally means nothing. Numbers are less than 8%. Strength is at less than 8%. A suspect Wang Jingzhu, the Han Chinese male, approximately in his 50s, routinely visits certain locations throughout the residential districts of the city. Locations vary in nature from commercial businesses to religious shrines and establishments. The cyclical nature of these visits to places seemingly unrelated to his profession as a political attaché of the ROC or his everyday life is highly questionable. A suspect consistently carries a leather briefcase in all unusual visits, the contents of which remain uncertain. The briefcase remains on person regardless of whether the suspect's outings are related to his profession, suggesting it's a personal belonging transporting items unrelated to his occupation. After extensive observation and tracing, it has been concluded that the suspect's likely in collusion with illegal underground worker unions, which, though the purposes of the movement patterns remain unclear as of current. Security forces will continue to monitor residents and whereabouts while direct operations may be conducted after additional information is acquired. Locations visited have been conducted by analysts and detectives to be dropped off locations for items and funds intended to aid the efforts of illegal union groups. Intervention highly probable. Two men were apprehended at approximately 4.38 a.m., both of Han Chinese ethnicity. The men were in the act of retrieving a cache of minor weapons and a cache left in the back alley of a tenement, 3A of the Serene Gardens residential complex, a frequent location of the suspect, original suspect. Police investigation of the backgrounds of both men revealed con concrete connections to the CCL, an illicitly operating union of Chinese workers. Perhaps this leads more to more secrets being uncovered. My god. I'm sorry, I'm getting very annoyed with this. Pursuing it through doubts. Jesus fucking Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm done with this, man. I'm done. I'm just using cons commands in the end. After the last meeting of the day, when the sunlight had become long since been replaced by the twinkling fires of Koshu streets, Chief Executive Yubuka Masu thumbed through the assembled evidence against the Chinese Consulate General. The pages were dog eared, their contents already familiar to the Chief Executive, but he could not help but review them over and over again, given the scale of the decision at him. Sadly, time would not be luxury that the Ibuka Master would enjoy forever. Was there a half miracle that the Chinese hadn't caught on to the police investigation already? The more time spent following up on the leads concerning the activities of the Chinese government and of those its uh, two representatives in Guangdong, the greater the risk it could all be exposed, creating a diplomatic nightmare. And yet, going in the other direction, accusing Consul General Song Ziguang and attaché Wang Jingzhu of actively subverting Guangdong was absolutely guaranteed to cause a diplomatic incident, and there wasn't enough proof to get Japan to take Guangdong's side. Would there even be enough evidence to ensure that even? And if so, why waste more resources on a fool's errand? Ibuka must be side and flick through the pages. There's no point in abandoning this. It has to be strong enough to take it seriously. Act with caution. You know what we're going to do with that one? Lockdown. If you're going to do this, please go ahead. I'm done. I'm done, 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 done. My god. The die is cast. The investigative team's conclusions were clear. The Republic of China was interfering in Guangdong's internal affairs, and that was at least in part responsible for the severity of the ongoing riots. The question of how to get this to stop, though, was a thorny one. China was almost certain to deny everything. Leaving the issue to be argued over in a flurry of diplomatic missives between Koshu, Nanjing, and Tokyo is likely to be an extraordinarily ineffective way of prosecuting the case. On the other hand, though, if the chief executive got Japanese representatives in a room as judges, the penalties for an unsuccessful case would be higher. Ultimately, however, Ibuka Masaru were reason that, since the case was strong enough to be prosecuted at all, not pitching its concerns directly to the Japanese would be an overcautious move. If Japan sided with him, it could effectively take any action against the Chinese, and so many messages were sent to the Chinese and Japanese, setting out Guangdong's accusations against Consul General Song and Attaché Wang, along with the demand for a written reply and a formal meeting with the representatives of all three nations. The investigative team's findings rounded up the report on what Ibuka Masaru hoped would be a knockout blow to the Chinese before they even had a chance to present a rebuttal. Does cast. We're going to get screwed over here. The Battle of the Junction. Corn session. First arrived with the Guangdong delegation, headed by Ibuka Masaru. While they took the opportunity to check out all the necessary papers were present, the chief executive took a moment to glance into the mirror stretching along one side of the conference room. He fixed his tie, smoothed down his jacket, and tried to work the stiffness out of his shoulders. The door at the other end of the conference room opened, and the Chinese filled in with the Consul General Song and Tashi Wang at the head of the pack. The two chatted to each other insultantly, trying their best to convey a total lack of concern over the proceedings. The chief executive caught their eye, and the two shot uh, foul glares his way. Finally, the two cons. Two Japanese entered. Everything went, everyone hurried to their seats. Consul General Takashima was keeping a neutral expression, as befit a senior diplomat. General Ghana, however, seemed to not be interested in such nice niceties. Scowling at anyone unfortunate enough to be in his line of sight, this meeting began Ibuka Masaru concerns the grave matter of China's interference in our internal affairs. As you've been informed, we've gained uh, gathered significant evidence regarding this, with a particular note to the involvement of Attaché Wang. A ridiculous song fire back. We demand an explanation for this impertinence. China. At this point, Takashima held up his hand, and the room fell silent. Myself and General Nagano will act as mediators, he said. Gentlemen, please try to be civil. Such unprofessionals will not recommend us to her side. The game begins. This is ridiculous. Right at the edge. The case flounders. 
As the Book of Moss will begin to set forth Guangdong's case. <clears throat> the tense. <sighs> Come on. Uh, uh, Chinese started to loosen up a bit. All the chief executive had managed to muster with a, were a moderate number of circumstantial claims. Consul Juno Song occasionally cut in with a few scathing remarks, but dared no more under the watchful eyes of Takashima Nagano. Once the Book of Moss had finished speaking, Song laid out the rebuttal. It gives the chief executive of presenting inconclusive claims as fact, and furthermore noted that the claims were not hugely inflammatory and seriously endangered the relations between the two countries. Both parties look at Takashima and Gano, who are scowling with frustration. They exchange glances and ask for a break. We could be in trouble here. And if this is going to get in trouble, I'm going to just go back. I, I have to use consequence. This is ridiculous. For nearly 15 minutes, nobody in the room moved, and the two delegations glared at each other. Wang whispered something to Song, who chuckled. Faint murmurs could be heard from the next room where Takashima and Nagano were deliberating, but nowhere near loud enough to hear it. By the time the two Japanese re entered the room, everyone was on the urge of their seats. Takashima cleared a sword and announced Japan's verdict. The evidence he held was not strong enough to require the deportation of Tashi Wang. However, he acknowledged that the evidence compiled by the Guangdong government was deeply concerning, and said Japan's intention to open consultations with China about the matter. Switching to the more informative tone, or formal tone, he then warned Song and Wang that should they try to keep up with this interference in another sphere of members' internal affairs, the consequences for Chinese government were likely to be severe. Without a word, the Chinese delegation got up and left the room, barely able to control their anger. Tension in the room would dissipate as quickly as, as a summer storm. Chief Executive breathed a sigh of relief. It's not large enough to drop the case, we can work with this. House always wins. This is bullshit. I'm sorry, but I don't ever cuss that much on this channel, but this is fucking bullshit. Joe and his two compatriots sat at a table in the burned out building, idly tossing dice back and forth. Kit sat at the corner furthest from the elements, still fiddling with the radio. He picked up nothing but different ca cadences of static. The dice clad around and around the bowl, each time coming up with different numbers. Maybe they meant something, maybe they didn't. No one was keeping score, even playing any real game, same as it ever was. In the distance, the great lads of shoot sparked the last snuffing out of their gentle caresses or caress of the moon, and making the small lantern they brought obsolete, slogans still litter the walls, and scraps of torn banners, discarded weapons, and general detritus continue to litter the streets as they did, they were so here for now. There had to be something, right? Just a little more push. Then, then things could be finally put right. They made better, couldn't they? They were the teeming masses of Guangdong, those whose blood kept the lights flowing and the margins high. The cops, the army, executives, guns, and money, or no, shouldn't be able to keep up with that. This absurd fever dream they'd all been forced to adapt as, uh, accept as reality couldn't just reassert itself, just like that. The rest, the rest couldn't all be gone now, couldn't they? Couldn't all be dead, behind bars were given up. The chill night wind gave no answer. We could shouldn't begin before trailing off, look, seeing the looks on the others' faces. He had no idea how he would finish that sentence anyway. In distant, a sound could be heard. This is such bullshit. Fucking Christ, are you kidding me? I'm sick and tired of doing this. This is like fourth or fifth time doing this episode. Baby steps. Oh my god, Jesus fucking Christ. Leading by example. If you want to read this, please go ahead. I'm not going to read this anymore. Baby steps. The reports of the Guangdong press on the outcomes of the constant consultations B between China and Japan had a definite tone of fraud and short to them. Time and time again, the papers came back to Japanese ambassadors' declaration that Japan was deeply troubled by the Chinese failures to control movements across its border of Guangdong. Several small biographies of Consul General Song and Lieutenant General Wang also appeared, coincidentally bearing the names of the favorite social haunts. Rumor had it that Wang had been bodily thrown out of a particular upmark upmarket bar in Koshi upon being recognized. Protesters were turning. Uh, out of the streets and mass as usual, but they seem a little quieter now. Fewer windows broken, fewer gunfights with police, fewer attacks on government personnel. In his offices, Ibuka Master treated himself to a glass of champagne in celebration of job well done, two down. What a bunch of crap this is. The end. You do it again, why not? The incident with Ibuka's dogs broken in the shack, Lee Chun's rifle fired away at least. It didn't did so for a solid three seconds before the bullet shells jammed. A failure like he was. He grunted, dashed out from behind the crate and lunged through the shots and screams towards the pistol on the ground to his right. You know when the pang of pain shot through his left thigh. The recoil faded from Lam Hyun Sun's shoulders as a man crashed into the ground in a pain hall, marketing, marking final, complete neutralization of the CCO leadership. Yet still, Operation 892 left no time to celebrate. Officer Lam dashed across the wreathing bodies and grabbed the man by the collar, only to find a pair of yellowed teeth sinking into his, uh, the gloves. Numbness hit his brain, then his baton did the man's face. Amidst the concussions and the brutal, bruised eyelids, Chunk could only make out just a little bit of his assailant. A man around his age, with features the same as his own, he figured that he knew this man actually, one of the policemen at a rally, whom he yelled at an eternity ago. Same badge number, same empty eyes, same everything. Thud thud, the rage had finally left Officer Lam when he finally dropped the blood strained baton panning. All that was left to do was stare at the floor and wait for the black clad men to carry the half conscious body to the van. A resting place for outlaws, for criminals, for all the scum of the earth Guang Gong had offered before her judgment was to be delivered, on second thought. John mused as he dizzily watched his own blood trail across his floor. The guy didn't seem to recognize him at all. Otherwise, the blows would have landed way harder. Maybe his tired ass was just seeing things. He supposed he needed some rest anyways. Yeah, I'm sorry, but this is too much. It really is just too much. Destruction and sensation. 
The marching boots of police, the burning of the bridges which cut off any escape route, and the forces around the factory surrounded the seas factory, the rioters faced off against them with only barricades. The police forces waited behind the ballistic shields, setting a professional execution strategy. Downfield's frozen between the two sides. Uh, the commanding officer, flying towards a war zone's uniform, comes forward with a megaphone and begins to speak. Attention. All the insurgents within the factory are to be dispersed. Failure to do so can and will be met with a force. This is your final warning. A pause from the officer. Uh, as he waits for the riders to come out or do anything, there's no response from, from the riders. No movement coming out of the building, uh, nor any surrender. The CCO will stand firm in his resolve. The commanding officer sighs and uses one hand in motion to allow the officers to infiltrate. The tear gas began to fill into the air, and the officers quickly destroyed the poorly made barricades. The police rushed into the factory shortly after. The riders managed to bring weaponry and ma gas masks. They shot bullets, and although some graves passed the officers, one bullet managed to incapacitate an officer. The officers fired back, but it wasn't clear how many fell. Blood splatters on the wall with different people. Thick mists of the gas, with the screams from help from the riders, left in an eerie silence. The shooting continued for half an hour before the riders surrendered. 37 dead, 71 wounded, and the rest were imprisoned. Kill them all. I, 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 I don't care. Kill them all. Maybe you have to kill every last Chinese thing here. Chinese person, so be it. Oh, I forgot we saw the, this thing here too. My bad. Coin toss. Whatever. I'm done reading that. I've read that at least once, and I'm done reading it, so. And without a view. Well, next time we're just going to skip it then. Suicide is painless. Whatever. Excuse me. Why did you, why did the game close out of that? Oh, we failed again, so I'm gonna go back and redo That's some good. of this. Investigation GFT two two one three seven. Uh, occupation or subject Ho Chi Man. Officer LC-229, we know your establishment has tied to several known figures in the GFT, including Subject 2137. What's the nature of your in interaction with? They're my customers. Half of Guangdong is part of the protest. Do you think I go and do background checks on everyone who comes into my shop? Funny you mention that, because our subject seems to be regular. Check the photographs yourself, if you like. Tell us if what you want was up to. Tell us if... If you tell us what our subject was up to, you might even have a shop when you get out of here. Screw, screw it, man. Help me out from town to town. I'm getting too old to haul statues and urns up and down the stairs. That's all there is to it. Subject refused to further cooperate with the investigation. Recommended searching for additional evidence. Either more photographic evidence of the GFT cooperation, cooperation or cross-checking financial records and client lists connected to the subject's business. Money never lies. So, and we're pretty much still in the same place. Struggling, 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 struggling. Screw the Chinese now. I, I just get rid of them all. Who cares? Follow the money. Who would have thought even after all this time was you putting the strings all along, said Officer Kamai to Queen Victoria. Facing sideways away from him. It was the British all along seeking to reset their vile imperialism into a liberated Asia. Oh, such villainy. Come on, shut your mouth. Get back to counting, replied Sergeant Goto. We're taking him to tour and check the books, not listen to your amateur theatrics. Come on. Toss the old British Hong Kong 25 cent coin back into the cardboard tray where it lay in, scattered with a number of all their old coins. We lay next to the tray with old stamps, but sir, I think we're done already. And what makes you think that, Officer? said Goto. Well, Sergeant, unless they're all the sizes of the. Uh, all the size of the seas. Come on, holding up the coin tray. There's no way the part would be able to hold enough inventory to fulfill the orders. In this place, he said, pointing to the splinter wood and faded decor, is a crapple. Well, the money coming in, you'd at least be able to get some new wallpaper, I reckon, unless it's a front, said Goto. He picked up the legend and looked through it again. None of this matches what was written here. The items are totally different, and holy, holy crap, you know who's in charge of transporting a bunch of these mystery goods to these mystery places? Looked at himself. I'd wager, said Kamai. Oh, you win, said Goto, pointing to the coin tray. There you are, your fabulous cash prize. Yeah, I'm done with it with these guys. The Green Trail. Following the trail, money left behind the proof far easier than teasing out uh, the truth in suspected testimony. Guangdong was no shortage of defect detectives familiar with the white collar crimes, the of the names of the client book to the bank accounts revealed further anomalies. As a multitude of accounts with uh, regular activity and round numbers, traced to a separate network of accounts that most likely were linked with dissidents. The fact uh, that the dissidents and the lieutenant in question foremost among them were exercising enough caution to engage in corporate style money laundering was a distressing sign of competence. But with a crack in the shell of secrecy surrounding the dissidents, all that remained was a pride open. Assuming the police still had the power to spare to plumb the depths of Guangdong's financial system, even as the Lego and the Javanese screamed bloody murder, the chance of their own accounts would, would be exposed. It was enough for a compromise to be proposed, to have the camp body secure enough evidence secured and sitting the names in question, even if taking the investigation back to the streets would risk discovery by the dissidents in turn. And that's why I say, just in case. <laughs> 
Because I'm tired of the BS the BS antics of the mod. I'm really tired of this. As you can probably already tell. Need for speed. <coughs> Perfect is the enemy of good, or so the saying went. And with the legislative council breathing down their necks and riders wreaking havoc on the streets, perfection was not a luxury the police could afford. Days passed by in a hazy blur with an army beleaguered defecti detectives. Coming through the transaction list to pick out the names most frequently mentioned and their prime suspects, an exhausted police captain handed out the arrest warrants of riot squads, his voice slurring as he briefed them on the resistance to be expected. One by one, the police teams stormed into the banks, apartments of office complexes, and the three pearls, and emerged victorious, frog marching their captains into the back of waiting vans to be whisked away into detention. The press ate it up, and so did the legislative council, patting themselves on the back for being men of action, sitting so comfortably in their seats. The Japanese were not as impressed when the interrogations began. The Guangdong Federation tradesmen employed middlemen to handle the bulk of the transactions, providing them with a cut of the funds, but all the rest, the police had simply swept up all the middlemen, abolishing or establishing a provable link with the, between the GFT's leadership and protest activity, but nothing more. Haste makes waste. One of two needed clues. Are you fucking kidding me? Come on. Only, is that it? Do we need more? Why do we need so much more? Why? Just why, 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 why? I'm sorry I'm complaining so much, but this is infuriatingly dumb. I mean, 12 and a half. I don't care what it takes. Give me corruption. Give a, who gives a crap at this point? If you want to read this, please go ahead. I'm done reading that one. If you want to read this one too, I'm not going to read this one either. So, it's just a generic thing. I'm done. I'm, um, it, it's making me lose my mind. I'm basically Ibuka Master at this point and losing my mind. Loose lips. There you go. If you want to read that, please go ahead. I'm not going to read that one. Now we're going to sell it to like one of the Iberian markets or something. Location. I'm not going to read it. I'm, t I'm, t I'm so tired of it. I'm sorry you want me to read everything, but like I, I just can't. I'm, I'm done. I've read it almost for two hours now. The description is good. Then picking, huh? We need to restart our interrogations to get more up-to-date intelligence. Set on crashing doors and shouting officers with met the spread of costs and frantic calls of surrender from the handful of people in the darkened apartment. Six people were handcuffed in the march into the waiting police vans while a platoon of officers kept a gathering crowd at bay. The following investigation by the police detectives confirmed what had already been suspected with arrest. There was no breakthrough. Whatever papers could be secured were already all detailing plans and logistics for a process activity that had already occurred. The leadership of the group had surely seen news of the raids and were no doubt scattered into new hideouts, none of which were apparent to the police. A few more locations could be identified. Most supply caches and meeting points, but all could be reliably said would be the Guangdong Federation tradesmen have proven themselves more resourceful and careful than the police had given them credit for. Or perhaps the police were too hasty and careless. This is so stupid. So incredibly stupid. Eluding our grasp. So incredibly stupid. Screw the Zhujian traders, all of them. Look at all that. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and... Well, we'll reconvene once we get close to the end of the actual stupid fucking crisis. Alright, everyone. So, after spending four more fucking hours doing this, I can gladly say... I mean, not gladly. I'm going to say, the devs need to look at this. It's bugged to hell and back. Oh, my God. This is... Why is Russia own that? But, uh... I cheated. I, I spent four hours doing this. This is ridiculous. It's, I hate this so much. But it's all over now, baby blue. Lieutenant Iwano wiped the sweat off his brow and reached down for his walkie-talkie. There was a bloody handprint across his chest, though Iwano was unsure whose blood it was or when it had appeared there. Still better than a bullet in the chest, like what Ono in the corner earned himself, as well as a significantly higher run number of riders. The arrow was filled on both sides with heaves, sighs, groans, and curses. Team 1 lead to containment, meat wagons arriving on the scene. Can you get them safely through the cordon at this time over? A crackle followed. Containment to Team 1 lead shouldn't be a problem. Crowd's looking surely, but we have the arms to hold them if need be. What's a day, huh? Over? You can say that again. It's finally over. Finally. So, I reckon... Soon I reckon I'll have the first decent night of sleep in. A globule saliva flung itself at the bridge of Iwano's nose, twisting around and can see the face of one of the student leaders, twisted in hatred and despair while the rest of the GFT leadership tried to look down as uh, downward as possible. Sorry, containment. One second, please, said Iwano, strolling towards his cuffed youth. As boot crunched through teeth, Iwano felt the nightmare lift. Uh, this is completely bugged. It is bugged beyond belief. I, I kept running through the same motions again and again and again. Even using cons commands, it, it just kept going through the same motions again and again and again and again. And I hate doing this. I've spent a good chunk of my Sunday just trying to do this entire thing. Oh my god, this is bugged to hell and back. This does have to look at this. Look at this. I had used consequence for this stuff too. Just, it's so bugged. It's terrible. I hate, 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 hate this. I cannot recommend this path for Ibuka at all. I, I literally cannot. 
This is so god awful. It's not funny. It's bugged, bugged, bugged. And I guess in the future I will never do the, the CCL before the GFT because I've always been successful with the GFT at least for the other one. But uh, I don't know. At this point, I, I'm not sure what, what, if there's anything else here. Like this is this is a, I hated this campaign. This campaign sucked because of the ending of this. Trying to get to this point has been impossible. I would never recommend this path. But smoke up rashes. If you close your eyes and listen, sit in the quiet of the day. It was clear that the riots were over, supposedly. Guangdong has endured many long weeks of blaring police sirens and loud bells of shouted slogans of unrestrained anger they'd only had recently ended, but now they seem to have distance so unreachable. With those discordant sounds disappeared, they were replaced by an uncomfortable, unnatural silence, but whether out of a sense of duty or just because it feels the right thing to do, the rhythms of life eventually returned to life to fill the void, and soon the sounds vanished, and people were replaced with a rather set of sounds. Um, if you want to read the rest of that, I don't care. Uh, throughout the rest of the tumult and chaos of the Guangdong riots, Chief Executive Ibuka skillfully reestablished control over Guangdong through uncompromising handling of the riders, which is bugged to hell. By staying true to his vision, Ibuka must now form a perfect Guangdong, where one perfection is rewarded and mediocrity punished. That's all I wanted. All I wanted was this goddamn tree. But at this point, I'm done. I, I, I have to take a break, and I, I, I will read this last one, but... I can't do this anymore. I spent over four hours doing this because the devs have kind of screwed it up. It's bugged to fucking hell and back. At last it has ended. We've made an end of it all. The riots are now fully in the past tense. The IJ has been made to understand their place once and for all. At last the harrowing years that the nation and its people spent lurching from one form of confusion to another are over. At last the state of Guangdong is truly free to live out the great book of Master's vision of a transistorized, competitive, uncompromising future. But at first we must lick our wounds and repair the damage. Let recovery and reconstruction begin while every cog of every level society returns to its deserved place. The work will go on and the work shall... And the sh Show shall continue as it always has been, as it always should be. But, like I said, th this is bugged to hell and back. This is god-awful how badly it is bugged at the time of this recording. It's so, so, so bad. It's not funny. Because I spent so long trying to get this top done, and it just it kept recycling itself over and over and over to the point where you can't win unless you use consequence. And even then, it's almost impossible. But if you somehow enjoyed this god-awful episode, please consider leaving a like. It helps me out. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we try to finish out this portion of the Book of Monsters campaign. And hopefully the next portion of his campaign, the other path for him, doesn't fucking kill me off. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.